on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I just love the idea of collecting ingredients and like going out and bringing food back. That's a primordial itch that I'm constantly scratching. Fishing is what got me into food. Uh, I've always considered myself a fisherman. Since I could consider myself, I've considered myself a fisherman. What do people get wrong when they cook fish, besides putting cheese on it? <laughs> You're trying to transfer as much of that energy as you can as quickly as possible to get that beautiful crust and sear. I always say hot pan, cold oil. There's lots of little tricks like that that, that line cooks know, that, that home cooks don't. Like this is one of the most ancient human technologies is knife blades. What we've been doing for the last 300,000 years is like knife blades, projectile, and fire before refrigeration how did we live that is the foundation of our cuisine across the board doesn't matter the southern states are all having a problem with this hog invasion and they're doing a lot of damage and anything that we can do to eat our way through a problem i'm all about it episode number 35 of the wild fed podcast the wildlife of tony seacrest restaurateur angler stunt chef is brought to you by sir thrival Sir Thrival was built on the premise of self-health care, the idea that ultimately it's you who's responsible for your own health. Never before has it been more clear. While governments, health agencies, and the medical professionals around us scramble to create policies and treatments for the masses, the wise amongst us are busy building the strongest, healthiest, most adaptable versions of ourselves that we can. Sir Thrival specializes in time-tested immuno and adaptogenic formulas for modern humans. Now, I've spoken at length here about one of Sir Thrival's flagship products, Colostrum. It's been shown in peer-reviewed science to be three times more effective against flu than vaccines. A recent article on the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine's website notes that colostrum reduces two key cytokines involved in the symptoms of COVID-19. And while it's still too early to know what role colostrum might play in treating COVID, they write, with a high-quality product, there is very low risk associated with bovine colostrum. Sir Thrival's colostrum is the highest grade on the market today, and now through July 3rd, all colostrum products at Sir Thrival are 20% off with the coupon code WEARIMMUNE. It's spelled W-E-R-I-M-M-U-N-E. Again, it's with the letter R, We are immune and it gets you 20% off all colostrum products. Again, the coupon code is WEARIMMUNE, and it's spelled with the letter R, Sir Thrival. Thriving no matter the circumstances. Go to SirThrival.com and check out the entire product line. Also remember that Wild Fed is more than a podcast. We produce a TV show as well, and you can find that at wild-fed.com. Head over there to see the first episode for free. It's 30 minutes long, and it's all about foraging wild leeks, fiddleheads, and hunting wild turkeys. You can see that again at wild-fed.com. And while you're there, sign up for our newsletter, The Subsistence, which includes exclusive stories, photos, and videos from me about the modern wild foods lifestyle. Hey, one last thing I want to mention before we start the show. If you're looking for a foraging pack basket, or really any style of basket for the foraging lifestyle, check out at ADK Baskets on Instagram. He makes your custom basket to order, and he turns them around fast, so you'll have it in hand in just over a week. Best of all, you can use the coupon code WILDFED for 20 bucks off your order. Again, it's at ADK Baskets. That's Alpha Delta Kilo Baskets on Instagram. And use the coupon code WILDFED for 20 bucks off your order. By the way, shipping is free in the continental United States. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Well, today's show is with Tony Seacrest, who recently hosted us for a week of hunting, fishing, and cooking in Savannah, Georgia. If you've seen episode two of the Wild Fed TV show, you'll remember our visit to Tony and his dockside restaurant, The Wild. My friend Lou had hosted us for an alligator hunt, and we brought a tenderloin to Tony, who prepared it for us on screen over a fire on his restaurant's patio. Tony's a really dynamic guy who never seems to stop moving. He's on the water, in the kitchen, and always running from place to place. He's a self-described tornado, but there's order in the chaos and his ability to balance it all, along with his deep philosophical underpinnings that inform his daily life, are really inspiring to me. 
There's a lot of gems in this episode, from angling tips to knife skills, ideas about cooking to bigger picture concepts about work ethic and personal growth. Some of the stories you'll hear in this conversation will be featured in an upcoming episode in season two of the Wild Fed TV show. So stay tuned for that. We'll be releasing those episodes later this year. And if you find yourself in or around Savannah, stop into the wild. The food is outstanding, the scenery is gorgeous, and they charter some pretty awesome trips right off the dock there at the restaurant. All right, I'm here with Tony Seacrest. In are we in Savannah right now? We are in Tybee Island. Tybee Island. So mm-hmm. it's its own township. It's its own town. This is the second time I've come down to Georgia to hang out with you. Welcome back. First time was a kind of by fluke. We were coming down here to shoot an episode, mm-hmm. our uh, episode two of our first season, and uh, our buddy Lou introduced us to you, brought yep. us out to dinner, yep. and uh, that was our our first episode. So we didn't even really know the show format yet, right. and we were like, "Wow, it'd be really cool if we could do a meal here at your place." Man, you were really generous with your time that day. No problem. That was like a Friday night, I think, or something. Possibly, Saturday, yeah, was busy like at that. your place yeah. at the Wild, and uh, and you cooked for us, man, and that was great. And uh, we've been in touch here and there, yep. and uh, so we've come down to just spend a, a week with you. We're happy to have you back. Man, we had a great time. We really did, yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I want to let people know first a little bit about who you are, um, what you do right now, and then we'll get okay. into your background a little bit. But tell people about you, about your brand. But all the kind of sure. things that you're involved in. So I am the chef and, and uh, the owner of the Wild Dock Bar. Uh, my partner Brad Siphon is uh, is sort of the front of house guy, and I'm uh, I'm in the back cooking food. Um, we've been going now. This will be our fifth year, I think. Okay. Um, and uh, we are a sort of not sort of we are a on the water local seafood restaurant. People can actually come to the restaurant and buy water. That's correct. Which is really cool. You can get there by boat. We have a big dock, and um, I think it's. I forget how many slips exactly, but plenty of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really fun. And we get a lot of outdoor, um, you know, outdoorsy kind of folks that, that stop by. And They've been out fishing. Or- exactly. And they'll, they'll swing through and have a beer and a, and a bite to eat and, and go go home by boat. So it's it becomes a um, sort of an event place when the uh, when the weather is great. Everybody, you know, likes to come out at once, mm-hmm. as, as I like to say. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Um, you know, I'm, I feel really lucky to work in you know, literally right on the water in nature. Yeah. You know, we, our prep room looks out over the marsh. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful place to sit and eat. It's incredible. And tell me a little bit about the food and the sort yeah. of idea behind the cuisine there. Cause uh, the food is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, very fresh, mm-hmm. very kind of local ingredients. Yep. Um, but it's a neat mix of a casual dining environment, yeah. uh, but also really like nice high end food. Yeah. So, um, and actually I, I talk about this a lot. It feels like, you know, we're a, we're a very casual restaurant where people can eat, you know, sort of in their bare feet and, you know, and their, their swim trunks and stuff. But we do a lot of the work of a, of a fine dining restaurant, certainly in the sourcing department. Um, you know, and, and obviously there's, you know, when you're buying fresh ingredients, a lot of the prep work is the same, you know, as long as you're doing it right. So we, we buy a lot of whole fish from local fishermen. Um, we even have a couple of our own permits where we're able to go out and, you know, crab for ourselves uh, and do a few other, like, you know, small inshore stuff. And we're working on getting the op- offshore operation running as well. So we're... we're Kind we're, of taking I, the gap out of some of those yeah, places. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really close to the water, literally on it. So it makes sense for us to, to find those resources locally. Um you know, our, our shrimp guys, Dubberleys, you know, they're the best. We, we get directly right from them, right out of the nets. And uh, we're able to, you know, control, uh, we're able to control our product, yeah. you know, which I think is really important. Um, yeah. And you just sold a restaurant as well? I did. We owned uh, Coyote Oyster Bar and Coyote Mexican and Coyote Ramen. Which was oh, sort there of were this, three, three it was places? Like, it, was a, it was one building that had three separate places. And it was oh, a interesting. Large thing. Cool. It was, it, was a, it was a lot to bite off. Um, but we got bought out by SCAD. And, and, you know, That's cool. Anyway. They're a local art school. Local art school down here. Yeah. yeah. And then you're also a stunt chef. I mean, we should talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was just sort of like a fun thing. Uh, I've got a buddy who's in the business, and they happen to be shooting uh, Council of Dads, which is an NBC Universal thing. And um, one of the main characters happens to be a chef in in the show. And uh, every once in a while, he has to do some knife work or something that look you know something that requires a you know more skill than your average actor would have. And uh, they get me to do it. And they put fake tattoos on me. They shave your arms. They first. shave my arms, which I'm not a fan of. Do they uh, shave his arms or those real yeah, tattoos? His, no, his too. Like they're fake tattoos on him as uh, well. Okay, they want him to look like the sort yeah, of they're, new school they're, chef. Absolutely, they're cult. They're um, they're uh, cult. Or what's the word? Uh, curated tattoos. Yeah. Okay. Well. Curated. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're they're like you know 
there, I think this Morton Salt Lady's tucked in there somewhere. Oh yeah, like a okay. lobster. And, <laughs> right, right. Uh, and then there's some stuff in French on the knuckles, and you know, it's yeah, it's it's kind of fun. It's fun. That's you funny, know? and it's also like it, it's a true stereotype. You know? Oh, totally. Now yeah. I think I'm the only chef without any tattoos. Yeah, right. You know, right. Um, I just couldn't I couldn't do it because everybody else had done it. But by the time I had thought about it, I was like, man, <laughs> I can't do this. Yeah, yeah. You know, like yeah. it's too late. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm 37. Like I'm not gonna get this. Do it. You're now. doing yeah. you're doing a different thing. Yeah. Uh, now outside of the restaurant, I want to talk about your chefing background a yep. little bit too. But then you're also out there. When you said that you got a fishing operation going on, you actually fish quite a bit yourself. Huh? I do. So actually, fishing is what got me into food. Um, okay. I've been fishing since I was five years old, wow. and ever since then, it's just been sort of all-consuming. Like mm-hmm. I've always considered myself a fisherman since I could consider yeah. myself. I've considered myself a fisherman. Yeah, because you hunt too, but you seem like you're more of a waterman at heart, really. Yeah, probably. I mean, I love the woods, don't get me wrong, Um, but um, there's something about fishing that, Mm -hmm. you know, just, it's, it'll never go away. Yeah. I spend a lot of time, like, doing other things in the woods, and, you know, and I do love hunting. Um, I'm a big fan of of eating anything invasive. Um, Yeah. And I like to hunt hogs. That happens to be one of the more, yeah. you know, like that I'm actually quite into and, and really enjoy it. Um, but for me, anything that we can do to sort of eat our way through a problem, I'm all yeah. about it. I think okay. that's great. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. So we'll get into that too. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about your background. And, sure. Um, I guess let's start with, you know, you were tell- one of the things that I really enjoyed about our week is hearing stories about your childhood because yeah. it sounded like you just had like a good parents who really invested in you yeah. and cared yeah. about you and made sure that you got to do the things that you found interesting and were passionate about. Yeah. And I just, it's weird, but I don't hear those kind of stories too much. I mean, I know it wasn't like some kind of perfect childhood or anything, but it's, it was, seems like you had a pretty good one. Yeah. It was very interesting. It was, a, it was a lot of, I have, I have, uh, I have parents with, with serious motors. Both mm-hmm. of them are, are, are hardcore workers. They, you know, they both own their own businesses and they're, they're just very intense and driven people. Uh, Cause I would describe you as very industrious. You're not yeah. a sit still type of dude. No, you're, no. uh, you're like, your brain is moving all the time and you, yeah. you're moving all the time and you are using that energy to produce a lot of work. I notice. Yeah. You're I always cooking to. something, you're processing something, you're running around, you're doing yeah. something. And so you seem like you got busy hands. And so that comes, yeah. that's a family thing. I think that's a family thing for sure. Uh, my dad was, um, you know, both they were in the, um, graphic design and, 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 uh, advertising world. Um, they had started a school together, portfolio center when I was young. And, uh, there was a, uh, after the divorce, they split. My dad went to Miami and started Miami ad school. So I was constantly surrounded by what creator, school? Miami ad school. Oh, okay. So I was constantly surrounded by either like design folks or, or creative people in general. Uh, and that was never really my thing. Um, uh, I couldn't draw my handwriting sucks. You know, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. You know my, my skills were always based a little more outdoors uh, and so neither one of my parents were, were really like hardcore outdoorsy people. Um, but it, well, I mean, I guess in a sense they were, um, and you know, they had farms and, and all that kind of stuff. So we grew up, you know, I grew up in an outdoor environment for a lot of it. Um, but they weren't, you know, they weren't like hunters. They weren't, they weren't mm-hmm. fishermen. They were horse people. They're horse people. Yeah. And, and so was I, you know, at the time, um, uh, I, I stopped when I was about, you know, 15 or something. Baseball took over and that was the end of that. But, um. I, you know, I still like to ride and everything like that. And I, I like it more as a, a utilitarian form of getting around the woods yeah. than anything else. <laughs> yeah, these days. Neat, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they exposed me to a lot of different stuff. And so my dad moved down to Florida and I got to spend time on a lot of fishing boats down there. And I learned a lot about flats fishing and it was, that was sort of the next. What do you mean when you say spend time on them? Uh, so I, I, hell, yeah, when I, mean, I was a kid, you know, and you just help out like bait and hooks and Being swapping decks. Yeah. And it's the lowest form of that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you barely even call third, it that. Third man. <laughs> third man. Yeah. Whatever yeah. it was. But. Uh, I was pretty good at it, and I could rig and and and, and hook and and do all that kind of stuff. So it it, it wasn't that big of a stretch, and mm-hmm. I really loved it, you know. And I think actually like Lou's son, you know, Albert, he reminds mm-hmm. me a lot of me when I was a kid. You know, I would go to these restaurants on the water and like sneak a fishing rod in, and yeah, like, never right. eat, you know. Right. And and I think that you know, there's something endearing about about that to older seasoned fishermen, you know, when they see that kind of yeah. drive. I think they, they want like to invest to, in you. Yeah, a bit. absolutely. So I think there was a, a fair amount of that. Um, so they moved, you know, he moved down there and I spent my summers down there with him usually. And I would, you know, fish a lot of, uh, I'd love tarpon. Tarpon was kind of my, my main thing. That was my, my favorite thing. And I could get to him, you know, and that, mm-hmm. that's, that sort of helped. So I'd sneak into like the marina. It's gotta be stuff. a real exciting fishery, huh? It's amazing. It's amazing. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's a huge and dynamic fish. It's casually amazing too, which yeah. is sort of strange, right? Like you can find these fish sitting under a dock under a steakhouse, you know, it's right. sort of a strange Right. And then there's people who spend, you know, tons of money to go stake them out on a flat and, you know, with a fly rod and all this stuff. And I'm, you know, sitting in an inner tube, you know, with a spinning <laughs> rod, hooking up, you know. 
So I, yeah. I think there's different ways to experience that, and I've had a I've had a fair shot at doing it from a lot of different angles. Um, you know, now, you know, when, once I started becoming an adult and stuff, I had these particular outdoorsy skills, and um, I was thinking about being an anthropologist. But the well, I won't, don't go yeah, too fast, don't over, go too fast. over that because okay. you, you said that to me the other day. Yeah, I've got a very I could see myself in another life wanting to be an anthropologist sure. too. It's a huge interest of mine. Right. So I'm curious, sort of what. Well, how you arrived at wanting to and, and, well, and what you wanted to do. I, I exactly. think, I think, you know, at the time when I, when I was, before I knew anything about it, I was, I was picturing Indiana Jones, to be honest with you. you oh, know? okay. Yeah. And, Explore and that's ridiculous, of course, of but you know, yeah. it was, there was something romantic about uh-huh. it and sure. really exciting. It's and, okay to be ridiculous when you're a kid. Right. right. You know, but I, maybe that, maybe I hung on to that idea a little too long yeah. and, and I got into the, the bare bones of that and the chemistry side of it. And I was just like, oh yeah, this is not going to happen. Yeah. So science, science. Yeah. And I love biology and all that stuff, mm-hmm. but the math side was just a little, a little mm-hmm. tougher. Me. So I, that that had been a um, sort of a, a dream of mine, and at a certain point, I was I just kind of realized I was like, this is not what I want. Um, I was expecting something else, and you know, I found out the reality of it. Right. So at that point, I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do, and I had these you know this small set of skills where I could cut fish, and and, and you know, and I could work with animals a little bit. You know, I could I could cook a little bit. Um, you know, I'd grown up cooking with my mom uh, a lot. We had spent a lot of time in the kitchen together, and so it was something. You that said I felt her background was like Italian, Italian, cooking, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's extremely Italian, and uh, so and that, so Dad went to Miami. She stayed up here, yes, Atlanta, Atlanta, okay. Atlanta. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I grew up learning theory from her, and and just cooking with her a lot, you know, and I just always kind of enjoyed it. And so, you know, something I did in high school to, you know, pick up chicks or whatever, you know, or just right, right. for fun or something. All of a sudden, oh wait a minute, I can cook a little bit. <laughs> Maybe, that's a, that's you know, a pretty in-demand skill anywhere you go. Always, huh? yeah, any, anywhere in the world, you can get a job mm-hmm. as a line cook. So uh, and make friends and make friends. Too, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. But I was in Athens at the time, and um, what I really wanted to do was find a, like a really great chef. Um, and you know, Athens is a tiny little town, so that led me to Hugh Atchison, who's um, you know now top chef dude, and you know James Board, uh, James Beard Award winner, and just all around extremely accomplished celebrity chef guy. So and uh, at the time, what was his thing? Uh, he was he was uh, he had just opened five and ten like three years before I started working there. Okay, four. So it was just starting to you know mm-hmm. stabilize and becoming like a real thing. And five and ten is still to this day one of my favorite restaurants. Uh, really love it. Wow, really? Yeah, and it's moved. How uh, long has it been? Man, it's been a long time now. I mean, I'm kind of old still now. So yeah, I was great food. I was like 22 when I went. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. You still like the restaurant? Love it. I'm I'm impressed that they're still around and still you know kicking ass. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to work, you know, I went in there and I knocked on the door and I still remember the shirt I was wearing. That's weird. <laughs> Do you um, want to describe it? A red shirt, and the, you know, <laughs> like I'm wearing today, kind of. Um, roll up sleeves, white check. Um, so I went in there and I was like, hey, Hugh, you know, nice to meet you, chef. How are you? All this stuff. And I asked him for a job. And he's like, well, you seem like a polite kid, you know, but I'm not hiring. I said, okay, well, what if I just work for you for free until you decide to hire me? And he was like, uh, 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 okay, you know, uh, like <laughs> I, 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 I guess I don't have a, uh, I can't a say no to story. that. You know? yeah, what a great story. And so I think I worked for him for like three weeks. And then at some point I was doing random, whatever, you know, I think yeah. I started at desserts and just learned how to play cheese plates. And, you know, it was obvious to everybody that like, I really wanted to learn. Like I, I wanted, I was there to download information and that's sort of rare. I think, um, I, you know, th- for whatever reason I decided this is what I want to do. You know, I'm going to do this. You seem like somebody once you get on to something. Oh, I'm you're so annoying, focused, right? You know, it, it becomes like a. It's uh, I'm just it just it's everything you yeah. know for that period. Yeah. Um, and I'd always liked ingredients just in general, right? Like I just always loved ingredients. So getting to play with them, you know, with somebody else's money was right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so one day, he happened to see me like cleaning a rainbow trout, and he was like, "What are you doing?" I was like, I'm cleaning this rainbow trout, you know, is that, is that okay? And he's like, yeah, I, I, you can clean fish. And I was like, well, I can clean rainbow trout. And, you know, grew up on a, you know, we had a trout pond, you know, and, and streams around my house, you know, yeah, I can clean a fish. He's like, okay, I'll pay you. Oh, wow. And that's so that it. was kind of that first thing that actually yeah, got me that job. That's awesome. And I was like, it took Wait three weeks for that to emerge. It did. Yeah, you, know, you know, I think that I was I was just helping out whoever needed help. And right. I was like, hey, will you show me how to do this or whatever? And so every little job that they would be willing to teach me, I was absolutely like I just wanted it you know uh and so after that everything kind of just kept rolling and um you know I, I kind of kept on that same pay- I think he, he checked me one time where you know I was I was still a kid you know and I was going and seeing concerts and, and all this kind of stuff and I wasn't getting the the, the the shifts I wanted and I was like hey why am I not getting the shifts you know why am I got like why do I have three shifts this week what's what's going on he's like well you're taking some time off you're doing your kid shit and I was like oh 
oh man, oh I'm totally doing that. Yeah. And and after that, like that how old really, were you? I don't know, like 23, 24, somewhere yeah. in there. You know, twenty three maybe because I started when I was like twenty one, twenty two, somewhere in there. Yeah. Maybe twenty. Um, but I, I I I remember being like, oh man, I'm absolutely doing that. I need to I need to step this up. So after that, I moved. I moved pretty quickly. Um, started cooking fish for him, and, and right about that time, I got this weird, strange job opportunity to go work as that head chef to apply for this head chef position down at the farmhouse at Serenby, which is sort of this little eco community in the middle of the woods. So you, all right. So you went from yeah knocking on the yeah, door, can yeah. I work here, to like up to taking a head chef position. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It's How many from, years? Like three. I guess yeah, three. Is, is that a very uh, is that a very common pathway, or is that sounds uncommon? To you? <laughs> it sounds like it should be uncommon, but I bet it's more common than you think. Okay, there are certain people that when you put them in a kitchen, mm-hmm. they just figure it out really quickly. And obviously, you had a lot of background. That, yeah, that and then, then I was able to lot fill a lot of those yeah. things, and you know, take some skills that I had but didn't really know I had, and mm-hmm. I was able to you tie know, them all yeah. together in that. Yeah. And I also think it's just like now that I I can sort of see all this more objectively, and I know myself better. That's 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 obviously what I should be doing. You mm-hmm. know, the brain, my, the way my brain works, all that stuff. It's sort mm-hmm. of, you know, you can be one good organized person, and we can do we can do a lot. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it's it's kind of obvious, you know. And I've always equated it to being on a dog sled team, right? Like you got like four or five dudes, chicks, whatever, all working in this fast paced, very like highly precise environment where everything is measured in seconds, mm-hmm. which. um you know, I think that's 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 a crazy thing. You know, to spend your life like it's a theme that I've heard a lot this week about. You, yeah. It's like you keep alluding to this idea of less people doing more things in a shorter period of time through precision and yeah. technical skill, which yeah. allows you to move more rapidly yeah. than you could otherwise. And it seems like you apply that to a lot of different things. Yeah, it's true. That's true. And I've never really that's a great way of putting it. I've never really thought about it quite like that. But the, you know, we have we have some really key people. Um, and, you know, a, a good key person with a little bit of help can do the work of four or five guys mm-hmm. that are just, you know, Yeah, average. you were talking, too, about with knife skills, for instance. You were saying yeah. if you can train somebody properly in the beginning, mm-hmm. they'll, over time, they'll yes. start to accomplish the work of multiple people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the time investment, you know, that you put into those people, and especially into just, you know, something so, so um, foundational, right? Mm-hmm. That's going to pay dividends over a long period. Yeah, since you're doing that to just about everything you prep, absolutely using those skills. Yeah. But anyway, so you uh, you applied for this position. Yeah, I applied for this position, uh, and it was down in the middle of the woods in this. Uh, it's like 1,400 acres of you know forest land and and you know kind of central Georgia. I don't know, not quite as mountainy as as Atlanta is even. Uh, so rolling hills, kind of Piedmont like terrain, and I got down there. I was like, oh my god, this is this is super cool. So they had me do like a food tasting thing and. I, I guess I, I did pretty well, and they hired me. So, um, you know, when I got down there, I got my own farmer. I had my own garden. I had all this stuff. Wow. And they weren't even, you know, it was kind of like a dream position because they were they were just like, just make really good food. You know, just, you know, it doesn't have, you know, tiny little menu. It's like 36 seats. This very boutique experience that could change constantly. So it was just like, literally, they let me play around. Wow. And it's good and bad, right? Great, well, great opportunity for you. For sure. And to learn how to work with farmers and to learn how to work in this boutique, small environment, yeah. um, it was really pretty fantastic. What was the bad? You know, I probably could have used more discipline. You yeah. Know? Like okay. you, you Oversight. Know? Yeah. I mean, I, I was too young to have, to have just gone out and done that on my mm-hmm. own. And eventually, I realized that, and that's what sent me to Italy. Okay. So I had, you know, I had worked there for a couple of years and, and really loved it, but it was how long can you live in the middle of nowhere and on somebody else's sort of, you know, property. It wasn't really my life. I was just kind of visiting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I gave my notice and, you know, told everybody thank you and everything like that and uh, moved to Italy and went to Atal Cook, which is a slow food um, master's program for Why for Italy? How'd you end up going there? So Italy is, you know, where my family's from. Um, I sort of identify more with their cuisine, I think, than anywhere else uh, i love asian and japanese and vietnamese food almost you know i love all that food but it's not really like it's not really my mm-hmm. my world so i thought you know all right let's 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 go back go and home. let's go home yeah let's go home um and i just love the idea of being there you know um was there for a year uh plus or minus can't really remember um learned a ton um you know forgotten a ton since i've been there as well but um, it, it sort of, it, it was a, it was an eye opening experience. 
um, not just from a culinary standpoint, but I'd never lived outside of the country before. And oh, okay, you know, so as you a, a culture shock as well. Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, have 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 thoughts about America and other places, but until you've lived somewhere else, you don't really have anything to compare this to. So yeah. I would advise you to just, you know, go find out first and, and then comment. Then, kind of then, then talk. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so it, it, it was amazing. Um, I learned, I learned a lot about like, you know, what it means to sort of be Italian, I guess, you know, cause I knew I had came from an Italian background, but had no real frame of reference. Mm-hmm. So I got to go home and, and visit literally where my grandmother was from. Um, and see that. Did and, you feel a kinship with the people there? Yeah, a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. um, brown hair, brown eyes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I met uh, some passionate pe- personalities yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you know, I'm an American to them, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, but they're, I had a, my mom's last name is Gaddy, G-A-T-T-I. And there's some people in the village that I lived in that had that last name. And so oh, that was, cool. that was a fun little, you know, conversation starter. Um, but yeah, so we, we, you know, I was there for a while. I learned, uh, I learned a lot about stuff that, um, I wasn't able to, you know, I learned how to taste olive oil and wine and all these kinds of things and learn sort of the technical aspect of this and learn a little bit about the artisanal side of actually creating some of that stuff. But creating prosciutto takes, you know, that's a, that's a mastery kind of mm-hmm. skill, right? That's a, that's a long-term deal. So um, I got hired to come back and run this charcuterie program for Linton Hopkins. Come back here. Come back to the States, yeah. Okay, how actually long were you in Italy? Italy? I think like 11 months. Because you've described that as a pretty big part of your education, essentially. Yeah, it was a, it was a good one, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, I had learned a lot. I don't, you know, I'd already run a kitchen even if it was a small one, you know, you still have to, mm-hmm. you still have to know a lot. So, you know, I, I had gotten a, a pretty good education from, from Hugh and, and all of his highly trained people who are now all awesome chefs, by the way, everybody I worked with in that kitchen are okay. all running their own place. Oh no, uh, that's awesome. And okay. they're all like killing it. So, right. um, that was kind of cool. Like that whole, we had that, our, our little starting lineup thing is all, all have great places. Now. How, so. how do Italian restaurants and restaurant culture differ from oh, American man. restaurant culture? Well, they don't go outside to take their cigarette breaks all the time. No way. Yeah, sometimes they just keep cooking. That's cool. That's kind of weird. <laughs> um, Ashes in the food. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's every place that I, was, I saw there was very different. So there was no, like, paradigm. Yep. And in the States, like, there's a little bit more of that. I do know they're more um, reliant on technology than you would expect. Mm-hmm. Technology that we would never never bother. You know, we don't have microwaves in our in our kitchens here, mm-hmm. right? Like, God no, we would never do that, right? Yeah. Over there, they have like ten thousand dollar microwaves and stuff. Oh and wow, it's, okay. It's, they're they're sort of enamored with this high tech. Yeah, that technology. <laughs> and, and I think you know <laughs> we're sort of disillusioned. Kind of, right? you we're know, like kinda, a microwave. Food. Yeah, oh, fifties, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of kind of vibe. So yeah, so that that's kind of like one of the, the main differences. Um, there's a lot more, you know, as far as the, the cuisine goes. Italian food doesn't actually exist, right? There is no Italian food. What you have is a micro regional network of people that are using. The sim- similar ingredients and have access to this Eden-esque, you know, uh, pantry, right? Okay. I mean, because of the growing climate. Yeah, I mean, if you think about what Italy is, right? It's a it's a finger that sticks down, you know, into the Mediterranean, right? It's got three and a half feet of volcanic topsoil. Wow. It it's got stuff going on that no one else can replicate, right? It's just it, it's just not possible. So, you know, they're able to. Uh, I forget what the. Oh, right. Uh, when I was actually visiting my grandmother's hometown it's a, a ski resort right in Abruzzo and um, on the ski slope there's this giant orange tree covered in snow with oranges all over it and wow that's a really great way of wrapping up Italy yeah. for me it <laughs> okay. was like how, how is that even working how does right. that work you know that works just fine apparently mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but you know fig trees grown out of the cracks in the brick and yeah. you know fruit trees just everywhere it, it's a it's kind of a it's a it's a food centric lifestyle, okay, and that's been going on for three hundred, four hundred years or whatever. People as, are as, really defined by the food. Yeah, that's what they live for. It's food and family, and and you know, it's it's everything. Everything revolves around food, um, and so in a lot of ways, I really respect that and, and enjoy it. Probably isn't for me full time, mm-hmm. um, but really, really cool. And you know, hunting is is still a a bit of a thing there in certain parts, but not really. Um, you know, fishing is obviously you know, a, a massive part of their diet, you know, along the coast there, it's, uh, you know, their, their, um, their markets are unbelievable. I mean, like yeah, truly they're stunning. still good. Cause uh, I've heard a lot about the Mediterranean being really overfished and stuff. Yeah. I mean, when I was there, this was a few years ago, but I mean, I think everywhere is a little overfished and, mm-hmm. um, I think they're, th- yeah, you're probably not wrong You know, mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. There are a lot of fish there. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of different stuff, a lot of small stuff, you know, mm-hmm. things that we wouldn't really even bother with. They, you know, they mm-hmm. have made a cuisine out of it. Right. A lot of Italian food is based on, you know, I think every cuisine actually is based on 
the ability to save food over time, right? That preservation aspect, you know, yeah. everything comes from that. And the development of flavor mm. when you start to preserve yeah. things, right? I mean, everything from beer to cheese to, you know, it's kind of like anchovies and everything, things right? like that too. You get that umami out of them. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know. But in a more basic sense, even right. Like before refrigeration, yeah. how did we live? Yeah. That is the foundation of yep. our cuisine sure. across the board. doesn't matter. Yeah. Whether All those it's preserved things. Has yep. to be. So, you know, we've built these compact, complex flavors over time through preservation and all this kind of stuff. And then we've established this cuisine on top of it. And mm-hmm. I think Italy is a really fantastic example of that. They have this incredible, amazing growing season and all this incredible stuff that they then preserve and change and, and create, you know, create something else out of later. Mm-hmm. And Olives and olive oil seem to yeah, be very foundational one. to... Oh, man, huge. Not just the cuisine, but also many of the preservation techniques. The like, people themselves, yeah. right? Like everybody has their olive grove and they take it to the press, you know, the, the neighborhood press. Oh, yeah, and okay. everybody, you know, that's a big part of their life. All right. You know, they're going to cook with that for the rest of the year, all that kind of stuff. So Neat. it's it's very much, you know, it, the olive tree is everything. At the center, yeah. yeah. Cool. So you came back. Came back. Started running this thing for, for Linton and, um, at uh, Holman and Finch. And, you know, I was new to it. Uh, very, very, you know unashamed, um, knew nothing other than a little bit of what I experienced in Italy. Um, but I knew, I knew enough to know that I needed a little help and stuff. So I did that for a year or so. And, um, and really I thought I just did, you know, did just fine. We produced some good stuff, but you know, it was sort of like the, the Ronin thing, right? Like you need a master. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I was, I was very aware that we were producing food that was while good and edible and all that stuff lacked the artistry that I had experienced in Italy. So I tried to find somebody who was, who really knew that world. Um, and, you, you seem to have a good sense of self-reflection a little bit here because each step of this, you're sort of describing like you recognize and identify a hole in your knowledge and then oh, you yeah, go totally. and find a yeah. patch kit for that and then you find another one and yeah. you fill that in. So yeah. that's that's yeah. a cool quality. i say that's accurate. Yeah. yeah. Well, um yeah, I mean, you can't worry about what other people are going to do. You can only fix you. So yeah, but yeah. it's it's not always easy to identify sure. where you're lacking. You sure, know? it's easy yeah. for it seems like for a lot of people, it's easier to build up a false sense of strength in areas than yeah. it is to just go. Okay, I need to go find somebody. To I'm teach sure me this. I do that too. Yeah, you know? <laughs> sure, um, yeah, we all got blind spots, but yeah. But you recognized that you you need yes. something else. I here. recognized that there was another level, mm-hmm. and that I wanted to find somebody in the next. It's level. like you said before when you were told uh, you're you're still doing kids stuff, and you're like, oh, I'm, that's true. Right. It's just not you know a lot of people would quit or whatever over something like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like it's nice that you have that ability to oh keep, yeah. keep evolving. Well, I think look, man. Yeah especially in this industry, like ego is a killer. Um, <clears throat> ego makes you believe your own bullshit. Excuse yeah. Me. And you get, well, please. And you get pretty stagnant. Yeah. You get once stagnant. You, once you start defending all the time oh, instead of innovating. It, it, it's the, it's the biggest killer. So I think that, you know, I started following a stoic thing on Instagram and that maybe, yeah, maybe that's cloudy. <laughs> uh, but, but I've been trying to, you know, just apply that to my life Yeah, recently. So okay. thanks for noticing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I came back, right. Um, did this thing for a while and really had a great time. Uh, learned a lot. Got to play with food again on someone else's dime and something that I'd never done before. Um, and so after that, I was like, all right, I need to find somebody who's amazing. So I wanted to write a book uh, on this incredible person and sort of just interview this guy and, you know, fill in the gaps for us, you know, Americans that didn't have this knowledge. Um, and eventually I did. Um, it's called Meat Salt Time. I found the, the, the guy I wanted to write it on was uh, Cristiano Criminelli. He was a, um, was he fourth generation um, salumi maker in Italy. His uh, great great grandfather was Mussolini's private chef, and he had come over to the United States to do, create this company with a, a couple of guys from Salt Lake City. And uh, anyway, interviewed him, went through his process, wrote this great book, went to, or went to Italy and, and wrote this book that you know I was very proud of and um, thought was a beautiful piece. You know, sort of like a, a love letter to salami and salami kind of stuff. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was, you know, I, I didn't get it. You know, once, once I really understood like what this guy, what Cristiano really was capable of as a, as an artisan, you know, he was able to walk into his curing cells and tell you what was going on before they even ran the tests. So he had a literally like an interface, like a biological interface with right. what he did. And that only comes from like growing up in the, in the environment. So with what, like cured meats hanging from the ceiling, basically not from the ceiling in these curing cells, right? Oh, They're okay. all individual because this is for commercial production and this right. is in the United States at this, you know, at this point. Oh, all right. So these yeah, are, yeah. you know, for real. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this FDA guy had, certified. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There was a guy on site all the time, you know, whole deal. So, um, 
we produce this book and, and, uh, you know, start selling it on, you know, just, you know, selling it ourselves and, and, uh, just really did it for the sake of doing, um, after that, I forget exactly where, where, uh, where I was going, but, um, I started looking for, for a place to do myself. And I, I had taken a couple of jobs, one for Cirque du Soleil and one for, uh, the Greyfield Inn. Cooking for Cooking. Cirque du Soleil. Yeah, yeah for, for the, for the, um, the performers and that was mm-hmm. kind of fun. such an interesting world I oh, you know over the up. years up in quebec i would i would meet people yeah. coming through who are yeah. who are part of it you know so meeting all these really interesting athletes and acrobats and stuff they're very cool people yeah, they're, they they're, really they're a strange group but yeah. uh, you know like you said very you interesting work really athletes. hard oh my god they're all so jacked able, you gotta work really hard they're yeah. uh, they're unbelievable performers mm-hmm. really incredible uh and, and just generally nice people they were all super cool yeah. um so i went down to greenfield inn and was spending a little time there kind of formulating my plan and I sort of heard about um, the Bottom Belly Yacht Club which is now the wild right and uh, it turns out that a, a friend of mine's uncle was the owner was one of the owners and we got in contact with them and we were going to do a little um, uh, you know consulting stuff for them and uh, and they didn't want to pay us at the end of the day or whatever you know for it and fast forward many years later I get a phone call you know still this whole time I'm looking for Looking for a uh, a space, right? And I was doing supper clubs and these big supper club parties, parties called Food Party, where mm-hmm. we'd get like a cool ingredient and throw this crazy party with all these different stations in an outdoor environment. Oh, neat. So it was kind of weird. And it would be centered around an ingredient. Yeah. You know, I think once we did, we, we had one that was called Sausage Fest, and then we did a, a, a shrimp <laughs> one. Yeah. And, you know, they were all kind of like tongue in cheek. And, yeah. and, and then we had a couple of, uh, of liquor sponsors that would do each event and got to be where it's like too many people and eventually oh, they yeah. just like wouldn't let us do it anymore. And they're like, you can't do this. Yeah. This is too much. <laughs> so, but right about that time, um, I, they had given me a call, right? The, the previous owners of, of the wild. And they said, Hey, look, um, we want to sell this place. Are you interested? I was like, maybe, yeah, maybe. So, um, I had met, uh, my current business partner at, uh, the Iberian pig in Atlanta. And, um, he was ready to, to go. And, you know, we, we managed to scrape up every last dime and, you know, that we had and, and, and put it into it. And, uh, actually lived, uh, on the side deck in a hammock for the first like six months. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. yeah. Like I was like, you know, broke and, yeah. uh, everything was in that. And it's like, I'm not, you know, the hell with it, you know? So I got one of those, Eno. yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And in the winter time when we were building the place, right, we, up yeah, silky exactly, thing. yeah. Yeah. So I, like I had the, it was freezing. It was, you know, outdoor patio with a, with a window sort of around, you know, three sides basically. And uh, I would like keep myself warm by the with a patio heater and sleep in there at night and then <laughs> yeah. wake up and you know work all all day and stuff and then uh, so we opened, got all that going and uh, we opened it and it was busy right away. It was like thumping, you know. We really? opened in spring and it was like thump thump thump. It was really hard to keep up. Like we couldn't keep enough food in house and uh, we were brand new. We had people that had never worked in kitchens before. It was you know it was a disaster, but a wonderful disaster. You know, still a success, but it was three years before I could ever walk away from okay. the Okay. How was it line. received from the critics and all that? Well, you know, we, we well, I would say in general, well, mm-hmm. um, they always complain, you know, complain a little bit about portion size and stuff. You know, we have expensive ingredients. Yep. So I don't think they were exactly ready for what that really costs, but mm-hmm. we have a pretty, you know, a very fair standard model. You know, it's, we, we mark up what we have to and no more. Mm-hmm. Um, we were very, you know, fish was the hardest thing. Giving people a piece of fried crispy fish like the one you had today, mm-hmm. the price points didn't work. So we actually ended up going to shrimp over time and doing a fried shrimp, which okay. we were able to hold on to and control better. Okay. So we we have we've learned how to adapt to specific things. So we've right. kind of bobbed and weaved around uncomfortable areas that to we meet can't. price points Correct. and expectations Correct. of portion exactly. size and exactly. all of that, exactly. but still keep your sort of ethics yes. around ingredients. So we've learned how to do that. You know, yeah. well put, well put. Yeah. Um, so we we figured out how to do that dance. Okay. Um, and here we are like five years later in our slow season and you were there yesterday and it was mm-hmm. pretty busy, which was great. So every year it starts getting steadier and busier. Yeah. So the first year was just like, boom, boom, just mass, you know, tons of people, so many people at one time that we couldn't, we couldn't really handle it. So that's all evened out and, and we're doing, we're doing great. Seems yeah. like it's busy every time I'm in there. Yeah. Um, I love the food too. And then we've been spending a lot of time this week at your place mm-hmm. here, which is also on the water, your yeah. new place. And yeah. so you got a nice view at work and you got a real nice view yeah. here at home, man, yeah. which is cool. I'm really happy for you. Thank you. Um, yeah. um, I, I could not be happier. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about uh, some of the stuff we did this week too. Okay. So we started off with, uh, well, I come down, we'd been talking about a hog hunt. Right. 
Uh, but you were like, you know, I really want to take you fishing too. And you'd fit in a couple yeah. of fishing opportunities. Mm-hmm. I'm really grateful for that too, because I've been off the water for several months back home okay. and, and my, ha- my mindset's gone like all the way over to hunting. Sure. And it was like, okay, we'll go fishing. And the first day you introduced me to Captain Jimmy. Yep. Um, yep. who's got a cool backstory, army yeah. ranger, mm-hmm. working with a lot of, uh, disabled vets and vets yep. with PTSD in particular. I think yep. P- PTSD is his main focus, That's right? his main focus, but really it's combat wounded veterans of any kind. Okay. And bringing yeah. them out on the water. Yeah. Part of yeah. He's got of a nonprofit called Not Lucky and yeah. he's trying to get these guys out on the water. It's, it's a really good name. It's pretty funny. K-N-O-T, right? Yeah. 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 It's just, I like everything. It's like triple on tundra there. And there's a, you know, when you, when you still start telling you the stories, like, you know, his first day in Iraq, like the first, his first first hour on the ground you got blown up you know yeah, okay you took it, you know, <laughs> not or, lucky it's just uh, yeah, it's, everything about that's exactly. funny because of luck and fishing and exactly. all that it, and it, it's, all the it's, not thing. it's pretty right on the right on the nose um but yeah he was able to take us out and you know, he runs a, a skeeter um and does sort of like near shore um a little bit of inshore. Uh, does how, a lot of Skeeter's the brand of that boat. Skeeter's the brand of that how boat. How would you describe that hull design? It's got really low gunnels. Almost yeah, it's looks a bay like, boat. Almost like a flat spot. Okay, it's, it's a bay, bay boat. boat. Yeah, right. it's a bay boat. But that thing handles water so well that, you know, I've been, I've fished out 45, 48 miles with him. No way. Yeah, a Man, couple times. Some of the, yeah. st- he was telling me that on a good day, he'll go out pretty far. On a good day, you know, on a good yeah. day, it's not, it's flat calm. It, but it does. And that, and that boat was nervous. how long? 20, 23 feet. Okay, yeah. Feet. yeah. Um, maybe. So we, we went out to target sheep's head. Yep. And uh, this is a species that I've heard about forever, but yeah. have never, you know, all week we fish species that I've never got to catch. Mm-hmm. So I've been fishing down in Florida and I've been fishing up in Maine yep. and the space in between. Yep. You know, there's a lot going on. And in there Florida, is. you know, I fish down there, but there's obviously a huge fishery. Yeah. So well, we we only share a, a little bit of overlap with Florida. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot of species here yep. that are there too, yep. but I just haven't targeted. So, sure. uh, so it was exciting for me this week because everything we did was new for me. And mm-hmm. some of the fish I caught were like, oh, wow. Like, haven't ever seen one of these. Right. right. Um, but we went out with the intention of, of going for sheep's head. So yep. talk, talk a little bit about that fishery because it's a crab cool fishery. Fish. So, you know, they, they only eat barnacles and, and crustaceans and anything with a shell. Okay. Know, and when I arrived crunchy. here, you had fiddler crabs. I did. Which yeah. are, I mean, these crabs were about the size of a half dollar maybe yeah a little marsh crab yeah thing, and know, they've got one thumb. the males have this yeah, one big one oh, fighter. obnoxious mm-hmm. overcompensated claw yep yep and uh <laughs> and another a species i've seen on the ground mm-hmm. i'd never fished with and you were like you know i want to fry a few of these up yeah, so try that it. was really cool so we yeah. took some of this bait you had a bunch yeah, of live crabs absolutely and you just flash fried them. Mm-hmm. We put a little sriracha and salt on yep. them. Man, they, I thought they were fantastic. I thought they were really fun too. Yeah. I, I don't think I'd eat a bucket of them, you know, no. but they were, it, 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 it's actually opened I up my I could eat a bucket of them. Could you? Yeah. Really? Wow. I could, yeah. Okay. Just like. Uh, I can eat like my, a peanut dish full of them. Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, whatever. Yeah, I, yeah I'd eat quite a few of them. Okay. Uh, anyway, I thought they were neat. Just like a little crabby crunch thing right. going on. Yeah. That's so all that, it is. that was cool. But that was our bait. Basically. That was our bait. We ate our bait, you know, uh, not all of it, but. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, the sheep's head fishery is is this crazy, uh, precise, annoying, um, wonderful fishery where you're using light rods with uh, braid, short leaders, um, uh, fiddler crabs, and you are fishing something that that is so delicate, delicately able to uh, break down the crab that very often you'll just bring back the shell with everything else being stripped just, out just and never em- feel it. Empty carapace empty, on a it. hook. The number it. of times, sometimes it would be one. I, f- I felt like, now correct me if this sounds r- wrong, I felt like a couple times I had one fish whose ability to do that was better than some of the other fish. Yeah. Yes. Like there was this yeah. one one time where... It's like 12 times, right? He just, I just kept coming yeah. up with a carapace uh-huh. and I'd go right down to that same uh-huh. spot and we were so precisely anchored mm-hmm. that I would just kept dropping yep. in the same hole and that fish kept, never felt him. Mm-hmm. And then... Jimmy ended up catching that fish. Yeah, yeah. He ended up, yeah, finally doing that. Thank God. And that's when I hooked into that bull red. That's which right. Was at, the was at the same time, time. I watched the footage. I think that's a good night. trade, honestly. Yeah, I'd I feel rather. good about that. Yeah. But, but so that that fish, he's kind of uh, how do you a spade shaped short and fish. broad? Yeah, spade shaped. He's got uh, sheep like teeth, human style teeth for non barnacles off a structure. A su- surprisingly human like. Yeah, I mean, weird. When you peel creepy. back the lips, you're creepy. like, wow, it has a little smile. It's weird. Yeah. Uh, and then they've got the crushers that go back down the yeah. throat. You know. Um, and yeah, they're, I mean, they're just out there all day chomping barnacles, but their candy is, uh, is the fiddler crab. So I don't know. We probably would have fed them 12 crabs for every one that we landed yeah. at least. Uh, we also got in some sea bass and then that big red fish that was, you know, we have our fishery right now for, for red fish is all the bull reds when they're going out there to spawn offshore on the near shore wrecks, you know, so like three to three to 20 miles is kind of the, mm-hmm. the main drag for them. So 
just about any time you can encounter huge schools or you know ones twos and individuals threes. individuals yeah because I felt like we were in an individual with that, was, that day. yeah I mean the, the I think the most only one we caught did we catch two that day we caught two or three oh, that day, but they yeah. were varying sizes one time I went up with Jimmy and we caught fifty three in two hours wow and it, every you know one would grab it and spit it the other one would, I mean you couldn't put a bait to the bottom without getting okay. one of these on so there are times when they really ball up. Uh, but you caught a, I mean, I don't know. The thing was, this is a nice one. Like, 28 pounds. It was ex- probably. Yeah. I mean, it was exciting boy, for me because the, here we are catching those, you know, those sheep's head are relatively right. small fish. The sea bass are relatively mm-hmm. small. And then all of a sudden, something, all of a Wham. sudden something's taking drag yeah. off yeah. my, my reel. And I'm just trying to recover line going right. like, what am I into? Mm-hmm. And you guys watching the, the video, you guys are like, ah, my money's on. That's a bull red. You yeah. know, you knew what it was, yeah. but I wasn't sure yet. And when I saw that fish, man, it was really, they come really out cool experience. Copper. Yeah, yeah, it's so beautiful. Like quite They're angelic, gorgeous. like almost mm-hmm. like illuminated from inside mm-hmm. the way it looked. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was really fun for me. And that Good. was a fish we couldn't keep, obviously, yep. over the slot, right? yep. the slot yep. limit there. But um, And for people listening, a slot limit means like uh, under this size, can't take them. Over right. the size, you can't take them. You can only take what's between these right. two. And you can't take lengths. them in federal waters as well. No okay, what. which yeah. is where we're the next day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I just had a blast on that, oh, that so, day. So and glad. those... The both the sea bass mm-hmm. and the uh, sheep's head are just fantastic eating fish. Yeah, I mean, I feel like if those were the only two fish you could eat, it's like you wouldn't have the worst life ever. No, you'd be doing okay. Yeah, yeah. you'd be doing you'd be real doing good. good. Yeah. yeah, really versatile. Yeah, you can do almost. I don't like smoked uh, uh, sea bass. It's not great, but mm-hmm. uh, every other preparation is fantastic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, second, and what I, I just want to give some compliments to Jimmy too. I thought he was a really precise is the word you were using yep. like the the fishery is very precise mm-hmm. and the way he wanted the boat for everything was yeah. so precise that it was like how I many felt times like, did i pick up that anchor man so many times that i yeah. ended up being like i'm photographing this yeah. you know yeah probably about 10 times you yeah. have you just like pick it up and, but it would like pick it up move it just a couple feet put it down again until yep. we were exactly where he wanted to be yep. um so that was neat to watch i had a great time that day and yep. um, we came back with a bunch of fish then and then uh and then the second day we went with Andy. Yeah, so Andy is sort of uh, uh, sort of the wilds or in my new partner in crime, so to speak. Um, we're going to start running. Uh, we've started running charters from the wild, and Captain Andy is doing those. Um, I first mate for him, um, which is really fun. And the boat's moored right there at the uh, right of the at, wild. Yeah, it's right awesome. there, right at the corner. That's awesome. So uh, you guys can come. It know. was nice because the first day we left from your place, right. we basically went across the street across to the with street. Jimmy. Yep, and then. The next day, we just go down to the restaurant yeah. and get on the boat it's there, fun. and it's that's pretty cool. It's that's their nice opportunities, yeah, you know. It's super fun. Uh, so yeah, we um, we are starting to run these these cool little adventure charters where the wild actually partners up with Captain Andy, and we do these catered events that are out on the water that basically take you out to the islands, show you a good time, maybe a little kayaking, a little little surf casting, um, some backcountry fishing or whatever, and then we have a little shrimp oil and a catered yeah. lunch, and then take you back. Awesome. So we're we're trying to start running those, and it's got a little bit of um, fossil hunting built in if you want, or dolphin tours. Or, it's more flexible. So it's um, a lot of dolphins around, man. Today, a lot of just, I went to walk on North Beach over here, <laughs> yeah, and uh, there was a dolphin just working on the inside mm-hmm. of the brakes, just yeah. kind of like right there mm-hmm. on right They're on the everywhere. beach. Right and on the you beach. ran into him at the wild that morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 came right out. up to you, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're they're um they're they're super cool. They're yeah. fun. Very cool. We had one that would follow us around when we were crabbing and became a. Like a, a, kind of like a pet, you know. Yeah. You don't feed them, but they, you know, when you're pulling up a crab pot, they're just getting everything that's coming yeah, out of the pot. Right. So they're getting food one way or another, you know. Uh-huh. Um, Symbiotic. Yeah, but he would come by and see me every Sunday, and would, like come to the wild and show off, and you know, he's obviously somebody's fed him at some point. You know, yeah. he knew the tricks, but he would come by and uh, all the customers would freak out, and you know, <laughs> he'd slap the water, and he'd come over and spin really tight circles. Oh, and cool. He was a show off, total yeah, show off. That's beautiful. So yeah, we went out with Captain Andy. Um, Took you to one of our favorite spots. We were about 20 miles off. That about 20 miles off, yeah. And uh, and actually, even with Jimmy, you ended up catching a red snapper. Or you saw him in super shallow water. Um, you saw... No, I don't I think, think Jimmy caught snapper. one. I think Did Jimmy you get caught a, a little. He got a little red snapper. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, and that was at you know in, in thirty eight feet of water. Yeah. So we moved off to about sixty eight. Oh, feet that's of water. right. Because I yeah. yeah, he's going like this. Fish should not be here. Correct. Um, right. And so now when we went out with Andy, mm-hmm. we were going to a place where, you know, we knew we'd get some sea bass, yep. but we big also ones, knew we ones. were going to get into the red snapper. Mm-hmm. And part of it was you guys had been telling me this fish is currently off limits completely. There's no yep. slot limit. There's Correct. no, there's no keeping any of this Correct. catch. And you guys were expressing feelings that this might be a little bit overregulated at present. 
We'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first I wanted to tell you about Paleo Valley's 100% grass-fed beef sticks. I recently received a package in the mail with all of their flavors. By the way, I like them all pretty equally, though I'm partial to the original flavor. Anyway, they were interested in sponsoring the show and I wanted to test out their products first. Now, I already knew the benefits of grass-fed, grass-finished meats with their substantially higher content of omega-3 fatty acids, conjugated linolenic acid, and glutathione, but I hadn't had many meat snacks that I really liked. Well, I still haven't, and that's because my wife likes them so much that she's gotten to most of them before I could. Seriously though, these meat sticks are excellent and perfect for your backpack when you're traveling or just need a high protein, low carb snack. If you're doing the paleo, keto, or carnivore diet, or you just want a quality meat source on the go, visit paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed. Again, that's paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed. That'll get you 15% off your order in addition to the bulk discounts they offer there on the site. Again, go to paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed and your 15% will automatically be applied at checkout. Again, paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed. There are several flavors to choose from and they're all excellent. These are not like the spam tasting meat sticks from that highly processed brand at the health food store. You know who I'm talking about. These taste more like a summer sausage made love to a Slim Jim. And as I mentioned, they're Avani approved too. Trust me, she's picky. Again, go to paleovalley.com forward slash wildfed and get 15% off your order. These are fantastic in your cupboard, your freezer, your backpack, your car, anywhere you need a high quality meat or protein source on the go. Now, back to the show. There's probably enough fish yeah. for there to be some harvest. Yeah, I, I personally think so. Um, just in the past five years that I've been here and, and fishing this fishery, I've seen a change. Fish are in shallower and shallower water. There's fewer and fewer grouper that I've seen. Uh, not that I've ever seen a lot, but I think that... You were at the northern end for grouper? Yeah, I think they go a little further than us, but okay. yeah, but we're, yeah, probably. Um, yeah. But we definitely have them. Um, and I've just, I've just noticed these fish are showing up in super shallow water. And I think you're going to see, you know, there's a lot of weight on these, you know, this is a lot of predatory animals that Mm -hmm. uh, if they do get out of whack, the damage they do is going to be quick. You know what I mean? There's going to be a lot of, they're going to eat the, eat the reefs bare, you know? So I think that we need to get good numbers. Now, uh, I don't want to seem like I, um, I'm saying that they're not doing that. There has been a recent conversation about opening that up. And I think that last year they they do a, a five day mini season just to gauge the numbers, and okay. I think that was kind of a, an eye opener because we were just like you'd hit the bottom right and get a snapper on Everywhere. so fast, and then wanting to take some of the bass, but you know, mm-hmm. too, it was like and with the bass because they had to be what was the limit on those thirteen, 13? in federal waters, yeah, so. 13 sort of the upper Total limit length. of the size of that fish anyway. Like, we didn't see a ton of those. We saw maybe 115, you know, mm-hmm. 250. Right. Most so of them are coming in at like right 10, there. 11, yeah. 12. Yeah. So it'd be like trying to get some of those fish too mm-hmm. and just snapper, 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 snapper. snapper, snapper. snapper. But yeah. then we started to get into some bigger ones. Maybe. Yeah. And actually, I think we were all, we were catching them. Normally, you used to only catch them on live bait, you know, like a nice, yeah. beautiful pogey sent down. That would get a snapper. Okay. Now so we're catching also them on squid. It, right. You know? In other words, squid. the abundance of yeah, snappers. Yeah, they're hungry. We saw for sure a lot. And we saw, it wasn't like we saw all juvenile fish. We no. saw some nice, mature fish. Well, and you caught the biggest snapper to date. You beat my own personal record. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, happy to do that, by the way. That you know, like, man, if there was ever a time for someone to do it, I am really happy it was you. Uh, was thank you, pretty, man. That pretty was great. A pr- that was again. I was that was quite, an awesome I fish. Was shocked by I, that. I am not fish. gonna lie. I am a little jealous. I'm a little jealous. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, the like the girth on the on the head of that fish was was ridiculous. And you know, everybody obviously you're hearing a fish story, right? So you know, that's gonna expand over time but i'm here to tell you like that's i think the biggest red i'll only be able to expand ever. on it so much because i have the footage. you got the photo right yeah <laughs> you know but I, I think that's the biggest red snapper i've ever seen wow that's cool so that's that was cool neat thing. because that that was a fight that took me all around one side yeah. of the boat to the other on, a, and back on your spinning and, rod on a six thousand yeah, no less yep, on yeah that six thousand yeah so um and, and there was two that were hooked up at the same yeah, time. Yeah, because Mark was hooked Mark up was at the hooked same up time. And got, and got wrapped. And I thought, we got to be all tangled into each mm-hmm. other, you know, because the way that braid was coming off, it's, uh-huh. you know, you can feel that, that the braiding in the oh, line. Yeah, totally. And yeah. so I was like, oh, is that his line of braiding against uh, mine? And I was so worried it was going to break I, off. I don't think they ever touched. I don't either. I, I think Looking just back got, now, I, think I, I don't think they did. The I think I'd have lost yeah. them otherwise. There was a lot I, of I think tension. it was a set of twins, though. I, I think they were both. Must have been coming through together. 
Um, but I had a, f- a fillet on of pinfish, I think. That's exactly I what, think it, that's was. what that it was. That's what it was. Right. That was that. And, or uh, hogfish. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Pin, no, it was a pinfish. It was a pin pinfish. Fish, yeah. But uh, wow, when that fish came out of the water, I was a little stunned. And you yeah. guys, there's a funny moment in the footage because you, you and Andy are running around, kind of yeah. uh, going like yelling, screaming, growing to yeah. get cameras, doing all this stuff. Yeah. And then I'm just sitting there holding the fish for a second, and uh, I'm looking at the camera, going like, you know, this, I just got, you know, sometimes you just get lucky. Yeah. It's not like I did anything different than every other time I put a line down. Right. Right. You know? Right. But uh. But yeah, just cool to see that. I sent a picture home to my wife and she says, uh, she's like, oh, you know, my gosh, like such a beautiful fish. Looks like a giant goldfish. Eh. And I thought, oh, that's really cute, you know? <laughs> so then I send a picture of it to Grant's girlfriend and uh, she writes back like, wow, it looks like a giant goldfish. <laughs> it re- I guess it really does. It does. I, I just step back and go like, okay. Bump really... the red up a little bit in yeah. there, you know, get it out of the it orange. It was a dark orange fish though, huh? Yeah. And well, some of them are red, some of them mm-hmm. are orange, so, you know, yep. um, they just look a little different, but that one was... That's like the thickest one that I think I've, I've, okay. uh, you know, mine was probably about the same like length, but I don't think it was like that one was yeah. beefcake. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, burly. I mean, you couldn't get your hand around the tail by Not like, at all. a long shot. Not at all. Yeah. And that's a big old paddle, you know? So that was, uh, you coddled peduncle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was amazing. Uh, so for me as somebody who doesn't really specifically go out to sport fish mm-hmm. ever, it it's undeniable silly. that, well, I got a couple of different feelings about it. Mm-hmm. But it was undeniably exhilarating and really yeah. fun. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And what I thought was cool was that even though those fish had to go back in, our bycatch mm-hmm. was fish that we wanted to eat. Exactly. So that kind of made it feel really, it okay. really cool for me. You yeah. know? Um, and it was really neat to meet those fish species, mm-hmm. the redfish and the red drum and the red snapper yep. being fish that I hadn't caught before. So Great wintertime species here. Mm-hmm. Good one to yeah. Good one to... To start with, yeah. yeah. Wow. Anyway, great time. Are those fish resident on the um yeah. the wrecks? Like yeah. they're all year. You yeah, can and they'll catch come. They'll, they'll come in and out, in and out. But more recently, it just seems like they're always there. If I could have caught that same fish during the mm-hmm. during the mm-hmm. time when the season's open. Those five days. Yes. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's cool. And actually, if you can get back down here for the season, yeah, I'd love do to do it with us. I'd love to. You should absolutely do it. And Andy's great. He really knows his way around the yep. water. He had a lot of good numbers. Yeah, he um, has great numbers. He's yeah. a great, good, really good boat driver. You know, can, yeah. can hold the spot. You guys work together as a really good team. Yeah, we like do. Too. Actually, I, I was gonna, you know, I, I was gonna mention I really like working with him. Where mm-hmm. you know, we're, we both are kind of Florida boys, right? Mm-hmm. So we both started fishing in Florida and grew up doing that kind of thing. And and so when you get here, you're kind of like the odd man out a little bit. Okay. So yeah. we were. It's funny. It's not that far, but it's far. It's enough, really not, but it's far enough, you know. Uh, but we work together well, and we kind of fish some some similar ways, and you know, we'll run ideas back and forth across each other. And I'm sort of the angler on deck, and he's driving the boat. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and seeing you mate too, I thought you were you, you really just good, clean system. I like Thank to watch you. how you handled fish. I like the knots that you used. Yeah. You know, watching you, you know, picking up a lot. Being being a new angler, and especially if you can. Uh, bring fish to the boat, then mm-hmm. people kind of don't give you too much input. But when right. you're new, you're kind of like, don't I don't really know that much of what I'm doing. Sure. So I picked up a few things from you that Good. it's like, oh, no one's ever said that to me. I'm really glad to okay. get that piece of info, That's, you I'm know. so glad that. Yeah, that so I got a lot out of it. Good. And then we went out to Andy's hunting camp. What yep. a spot. Man, that, that was awesome. Yeah, Wichita, yeah. So that was the whole kind of idea. It was like hog hunting. Now, I yeah. came I came with night vision goggles. Oh, man, you had the kit. Thermal, yeah. <laughs> thermal like rifle scope. Yeah. The suppressed 300 blackout. Yep. I was geared up, so ready. Ready. Yeah. You know, we had everything kind of dialed in. You guys had been pre-baiting an area yep. and the uh, and got me onto a stand where it looked like there'd been some activity. Yeah. And my hog can't, comes in and that's uh, just a, a lone hog, yeah. kind of a big boy. And I level that set of crosshairs right on his, I guess like right on his ear. Yeah. Shot is really good, really clean, like... I saw the footage. Yeah, man. we watched the footage a lot. <clears throat> but that hog just turns and runs yeah. and goes who knows where. Yeah. And we started to crawl down into a hell hole. Yeah. And then it just got to where it was like, okay, this where it are we going to go dangerous. exactly here? Yeah. This is there's yeah. no blood trail, nothing. Yeah. So we lost. So that hog goes unrecovered, and mm-hmm. that's my sort of first time hog hunting. And now I'm like, oh man, I want to. I want to do it again. Yeah. Know? Well, you know, and we, we had to play the weather this week. You know, yeah. uh, we had some really warm weather early that was great for fishing, but, you know, terrible for hog hunting. Uh, and when you know, I don't like to be in the 80s and shoot something. Yeah. That's sort of the mm-hmm. kind of the, the point where it's like, because uh, yep. you've got to let that thing sit for 12 hours or whatever it is mm-hmm. and make sure that everything happens. You know, if you then you run into coyote problems and or just. Yep. You know, hot guts being an issue. So right. we kind of had to make our moves and, and 
gave you good, you know, one and a half nights sort of to hunt. So yeah. it was it was high pressure, and uh, I saw the footage, and the, the shot was perfect. You know, I've I've seen you shoot. I know where that uh, I know that that hit him in the head. Yeah. You know, and either the 300 blackout but is just a little, a little under, ane- I think it's a little anemic. I yeah. think I think I would have liked to have been sighted in for a little bit further. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, the shot I felt really good about the shot. But I, I One just of feel two like it's happened. Really... Either you hit him in the head and it bounced off, or you literally gave him. You know, yeah. you shaved his chin, shaved chin his chin, or something. Yeah. yeah, if we had some bullet drop. But anyway, mm-hmm. I feel like uh, it was a cool introduction. So thank oh, you yeah. for that too, oh, because you kind of introduced me to several new species mm-hmm. in a week's time, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Covered some ground. We did. I wanted to ask you a yeah. little bit about um, sort of cooking with. I guess I wanted to ask you for people listening, yeah. especially people who aren't chefs, mm-hmm. who maybe are home cooks or even just like starting to really cook with yep. whole food type mm-hmm. stuff, especially with their own wild ingredients yeah. or people who are kind of new to fishing. When you're thinking about cooking with fish, what mm-hmm. are, what are your beginner sort of tips for people? And what do people get mm-hmm. wrong when they cook fish besides putting cheese on it? Oh, that's a big one. That's thank you. That's a good one. I'm glad <laughs> we let get it, that out of the way. That, yeah. Uh, well, I think a lot of it is, is getting the product. Um, you know, most people say, Oh, I don't eat fish. You know why? It's cause you had really bad fish. Yeah. Um, so good way to start is, you know, get a skin on great looking filet. It should be translucent and, and bright, not cloudy or soft. Um, you want something that's firm and, and, and looks pretty and look, just ask the, ask the fishmonger, mm-hmm. you know, Hey, what, what's the best thing you got right now? What, what's the newest, prettiest, what are you proud of? And they'll tell you, and they'll absolutely tell you, um, using enough salt. That's a big one, mm-hmm. you know? Um, it's hard to say on a podcast cause it's all parts per square inch, but I've got a particular system that I do where I can, you know, I use my arm as a fillet and I'll wet it and I'll throw salt down and I'll show people, all right, that's correct. That's correct. And oh, I'll look at a, you know, a parts per square million for, for the thickness of the actual fillet. Yeah. And then I'll give you kind of a, a basic. Oh, I wish I'd picked that up for you. Well, that's cool. Next time. Right? Yeah. Um, and so there's lots of little tricks like that, that, that line cooks know that, that home cooks don't, you know, starting with a really hot pan. Okay. Before you put your oil in. Why? You know? So otherwise you have burn oil and mm-hmm. you have a cold pan. Okay. What you're doing is you're storing energy in that pan. And when you put that fillet down, you're trying to transfer as much of that energy as you can as quickly as possible to get that beautiful crust and sear. Right? Oh, okay. So if you put your oil in, the oil gets hot and the pan doesn't. You have burning, smoking oil that tastes terrible and no heat in the pan ready to deliver into that fillet. Got it. Right? Okay. Yep. So I always say hot pan, cold oil. That's a big one. Um, the other is, thing is... is that's- True for everything you cook? Pretty much. I mean, if you're trying to get a crust, yeah, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you're poaching. That's not the mm-hmm. case. But yeah, for, for searing, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Great. So, you know, some basic technique stuff, um, I think, is really big. You know, knife work, obviously. Um, you know, no I want to come back to knife work. We'll come back to knife too. work. Okay. Yeah, All I right. think there's something there. So, there's a few little things that are just, you know, stu- stuff that they don't go over in the joy of cooking. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you cooked fish for me several ways. Yeah. I want to talk about some of it. Um, okay. You did uh, just kind of a classic whole fish mm-hmm. prep with the sheep's head. Um, and we did on the first night with the... Uh, at the restaurant? Uh, yeah, but we also hear the first night you had a sea bass for us oh, too. Okay. That was whole, the first day when we arrived. Okay. Um, so oh anyway, yeah, I did it in the wrapped in the right, banana right leaves. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's yeah. right on the grill. Mm-hmm. So that was fantastic. That was like steamed in banana leaves. Yep. Really, really good. tomato jam, yeah. Um, love that. You did... Um, the one thing I really liked is you would break down fish... And keep rib cages, uh-huh. collars, yeah. heads in some cases, and actually that, that Heathcliff skeleton, or yeah. what you call it, the, uh, the Garfield, Garfield skeleton, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and cook those. Yeah. Man, that's a really cool thing because we got this whole beautiful. I'd almost say it's like if you thought of with these fish, it's like the, it's sort of like with a bird where you get the breast meat, yeah. and then you got yeah. the dark meat, yeah. Yeah. and it was like we got the white meat off of the fillet, mm-hmm. and then we get the dark meat off the collars, ribs, yep. and skeleton. And you got more fat there, all this flavor, mm-hmm. the juices from the bones, and there's enough food there for a meal. We call them chef snacks. Mm-hmm. So those are the things that chefs tend to eat. Yep. You know, they, they'll they pick off all the little parts that nobody sure. else eats. It so. makes me think when I was in Newfoundland, they, uh, you know, traditionally so much cod moving mm-hmm. through the docks there. And cod tongue, mm-hmm. we were told, was this, you know, recipe the fishermen would eat at home because... Nobody wanted the fish tongues, right. and they're delicious. Huh. Uh, the heads and tongues are just outrageous. But I was told the young kids, you know, like you when you were a kid right. working on the right. boats, they'd be at the docks cutting out tongues and selling those to the local uh-huh. people because the fillets were what had market value. Sure. So that was sort of like the, yeah, the it's fisherman's. It's like oxtail back in the day mm-hmm. or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, but anyway, those uh, those ribs really impressed me, especially from the sheep's head because it has such substantial They're ribs. They're so thick, yeah. They're yeah. easy to eat around mm-hmm. and everything. You're not yeah. pulling little hair-like bones out of your yeah. mouth or anything. Yeah, it's not as dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really good. What else did we do? We did some kind of fried in like a beer batter. That was really super, nice. Super traditional, you know, but we mm-hmm. took some some Japanese technique and applied that to you know what we were what we were doing. Specifically, what do you mean by that? So the way like you make a tempura, right? You're trying to get really cold club soda and, and rice flour and create this like foam slurry. We essentially did the same thing, but mm-hmm. we just used beer instead. So we're kind of bridging that gap between, you know, yeah, down home cooking and and, and something a little I like more. That. You know? I like that. And that that's elevating the down home. Yeah, we, we do we do a fair amount of that. You know, um, we we like that. Uh, and really, what I, I kind of figured out when I was talking to Grant today um, about it, it was like we're frying bubbles, right? Yeah, we're frying bubbles. Yeah. that's that is what a good tempura or a beer batter should be about, rather right. than making it, letting it sit forever. Kind of like trapping them in there. They're trapping huh? them in there. Absolutely, they get like crusted Absolutely. outside Absolutely. and they're trapped in there. Yeah, we're yeah. frying bubbles. So that was great. And then one thing that really stood out to me was you um, packed a sheep's head in a salt and yeah. egg white kind of concrete. Salt crust. Yeah, yeah, salt crust. Yeah. And uh, but you must have baked it. Like yep. That. Yep. Anyway, I really enjoyed that too because I felt like the presentation was. Every part of the fish is there for you to sure. eat at, you know, and, and I it like comes that. out looking cleaner than you expect, right? Yeah, it, it came out like, once like you took the is. crust off. Yeah, like the skin had yeah. still all its color. Mm-hmm. I could see the mm-hmm. whole fish, and the even the eye looked yeah. really yeah. good. Like yeah. it was like, wow, this is the entire fish. Mm-hmm. So there was something really primordial about that that yeah. I like. So yeah, I thought that was all really fun. Cool. So anyway, I something really to try at home. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I will be, and um, and just feel like I'll get more utilization out of my mm-hmm. fish after having seen what you do with them. Cool. Um, so that was awesome. I'm going to have to do a, a tutorial about breaking down the head. I did a little yeah. bit on, on That's camera. That's something I'd like to like to see you do. Remember more. this, right? I, I've, for those of you at home, you can't see this, but I'm, I'm putting one finger on top of the other, right? In a, like sort of this, you know, yeah, just one, stacked, stacked, yeah. stacked, right? And that creates a little angle for the knife to slip in between and you... Whoosh, whoosh, and that's how you unlock all the pieces on the, the head. The collar in the head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That collar being sort of where the pectoral fin and then the yep. cartilage yep. that is in under the neck. Mm-hmm. And that's just this underutilized piece of meat. And Yeah, that's a good one and an easy one. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in, in Japanese food, they, they do that, you know, hamachi kama. Yep. You're familiar with that. That's, yep. a, that's pretty common. Um, and, you know, they just kind of fry it without any batter on it. You know, just put some yep. color on it. And then it's usually eaten with a little ponzu. Just if you fillet a fish, that's just on there still. Yeah. Piece of meat yeah, gets left exactly. behind. So, so you got to attach that from the head mm-hmm. and then from the fillet. That's the that's the yeah. middle spot. So. Yeah, I like that. I like just that idea of anglers learning to reduce waste. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For a lot of reasons. Because it's like, one, just being that food value there, right? right? You've right. put all that work in. and Particularly when you're... I have a boat now. And now I really understand. Like, people make jokes out of it. I hear so many about right. them. Like, what's a boat? It's like Break a out whole, another thousand? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So... You're putting all that energy financially and just, str- I mean, for me, trailering Emotional my boat stress. an hour down to the sea and getting it in and getting it out and then mm-hmm. getting home and you bring your buddies out and they're like, great time. And they leave and then there you, you are spraying it. the boat uh-huh. down and flushing the motor and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then winterizing it where I live, oh, yeah. all that work. It's like, if I can get a little more food value out of what I catch. It makes it worthwhile. It sure makes sense to yeah. do it. So. Yeah, I appreciated that. I wanted to ask you, too, because you hunt hogs, Mm -hmm. um, a little bit about your hog hunting, I guess, and sort of how you focus on it. Like, what's your your sort of methodology, and then also how you approach it as a food? Because it seems to me, from what I hear, hogs can be really great, and they can be terrible. That's yeah. just like what you hear from people. So I'll, I'll just, I'll give you the general rundown. So, you know, the, the southern states are all having a problem with these, with this hog invasion, and they're doing a lot of damage, and certain areas seem to be more able to... Um, keep them at bay than others mm-hmm. you know they, they seem to flourish in these very particular environments that you know central georgia farmland you know they can do a tremendous amount of damage they can get into the bottoms and stuff and, and hide and so they've got hog eradication teams that are you know working all the time and you know i, I think it's an underutilized resource you know um, absolutely if we're gonna kill them i mean we it's like yeah. and they're this is what's interesting to me is the if if you're not from just a couple of monotheistic religions that is against hog eating, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everybody else likes eating hog. Yeah. Everybody is into bacon. I mean, that's gotten to be such a meme and a cliche thing, right? And it's like, now bacon's even in some circles is like a health food. You got this like renaissance around pork. Mm -hmm. The number of restaurants and pubs named with the word pig or... Oh my God. Right? In it. I mean... It's such a celebrated food, mm-hmm. and then we have them like wild on the landscape mm-hmm. that are invasive mm-hmm. and highly, um, well, highly invasive. And in addition to being non-native, which makes sort of when we have that arrangement mm-hmm. of things, it's like 
harvest at will. Right. Then you have the states being like, well, we basically aren't really regulating this. Mm -hmm. This is a species that I can hunt at night with night vision and a thermal optic and a 30 round magazine. It's like not how you can deer hunt. So, correct. Um, and then the idea that this food resource isn't being, because it's so much of the country. Now, I live in a place north of mm-hmm. this so-called invasion, right? Right. But, uh, so I didn't really know. I came down here and you guys were just pointing out hog damage. And I was like, wow. That it was looks minimal, like somebody actually. came in and with a tractor and yeah. was turning over soil. Literally right? like shovel heads. Yeah. That's, and that's, you look at their really unusual skull. Mm-hmm. The species is Sue Scroffa. He's built for that. Yeah. And, um, man, seeing the damage was really remarkable. Imagine um, that, you know, across your whole melon patch or yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, that would be hard to be hard to handle. It'd be hard to deal with. Um, also, their fecundity is so high. It's like one of these animals where it's like trying to eradicate rats or something. Yep. It's like kind of yep. good luck. You'd think because they're bigger that you'd be able to track them all down, but you'll get places like Hawaii where they have many tanks. Yeah, you know they just. I mean, mm-hmm. when we were, you know, we had a dog, and you and me going through the bushes, and we couldn't. You know, going through the bushes armed with firearms right. with a dog and it's like I'm nervous oh very you know you were telling me stories about how with those tusks like yeah. you know, they get into a femoral artery oh yeah they because some of and I'm watching video you sent some video of them charging yeah. people they're being shot with a semi-automatic rifle as it's charging this yeah. guy and you're and this hog is just sucking up rounds yep. and continuing to run yep. which made me think about because that shot I took on the hog mm-hmm. he, now I saw from this other video, this guy's shooting him. You're just seeing impact, impact, right, impact, right. and the hog is not, not being doing slowed anything. down. Mm-mm. He at one point finally veers away, yep. but he doesn't like fall over yep. the way most animals would. Mm-hmm. So it seems likely to me that if I did hit that hog, he could have run just Along like way. that. It seems yeah. like it wouldn't really affect him that much. Well, and, and the bullet will bounce off the skull. That's like, that crazy. is a thing. So what a skull. You know, and catching yeah. it at the right, you know, you know how those angles are. Like, if yeah. you get them just like this, it might skip or off. Or just ride between the fascia yeah. and the bone exactly. and just kind of exit somewhere. Exactly. Or stay in there. Um, but anyway, uh, here we have this resource on the landscape mm-hmm. across so many states. And I would, I think there is sort of a renaissance around using them, huh? Yeah. The problem is, is getting that. into the commercial market, right? Like, you can cook them at home and everybody can do that and it's all well and good. But we are kind of past that point. I yep. think we're at the point where we need some help from, you know, some, some, some big organization. That will, you know, help get these process these mobile processing plants down here. So some of these guys can go down and trap. Who's doing that mobile processing? I, you know, plants? I know they're doing it out west a little bit, so I okay. know it's happening. It's a thing. It's a thing, but I don't know. You know, we're gonna have to make a lot of steps. They have to be live trapped. They have to right? be live trapped so they can be okay. Tested so for, like so I just want to say that for people yeah. listening. So if you shoot a hog in the field, that hog cannot be sold into the marketplace. Correct. If you trap a hog live mm-hmm. and he goes into a USDA slaughterhouse, mm-hmm. then it can be. That's why you can order boar or a wild boar or wild hog on yep. a menu from time to time. Mm-hmm. It's because it's it's been killed in a USDA yep. facility. Yep. So you got people with what like kind of big cage trap, live traps, mm-hmm. big culvert traps mm-hmm. or whatever. And, and most of them right now that are available for commercial purpose come out of Texas. Yep. Texas obviously being another you know hog invaded area. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, good for them. Uh, I just think that the Southeast needs to get on that as well. Yeah. You know, we need to we need to eat more wild boar uh-huh. um, just as a population. We need to eat more. Um, you know, if we could get some of these, you know, to homeless shelters and stuff like that, obviously that would be great. But we need the infrastructure to do it. So, you know, we, we need to figure out a way to make it easier for the guys that are trapping these things to get these pigs to market ultimately yep. is, is what we're talking about. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not that far along in this yet, so I, I don't have the answer. Um, I got the impression though you got a pretty practiced hand at, at butchering them and uh, working pigs with Pigs in general. I, I've broken down a lot uh, of pigs. Okay, you've broken down a lot know, of pigs, yeah. Uh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. All right. You know, we get a, we get, I've been getting a pig or two a week for a long time. Oh, okay. So it's, you know, Holman and Finch way back in the day, you know, it yeah. was a lot of... I think we did three pigs a week there. Okay. Um, and I would do all of them. So. What have you noticed? T- talk to people through who are listening, especially for somebody who might think like, oh, I'm going to go hog hunting. I love pigs. Right. It's like, talk about the differences between Different a animal. wild hog yeah. and a domestic yeah. pig. So a uh, domestic pig, you know, let's just say that's the same size as a, as a domestic hog. You're going to see a lot less oh, bone. As a wild hog, you mean? Yeah, as a wild hog, excuse me. Uh, you're going to see a lot less bone. Like the, the bone size of a wild boar is twice the size okay. of So you got of like, that of they call that gracile or gracilization. Is, is that what, okay. Yeah, like, like humans are very gracile compared to um, uh, Homo erectus or uh-huh. something. We right. Thinner, slender, right. graceful. Big, gracile, right. graceful. Right. Yeah. yeah, these are big boned. Yeah. Yeah, these are big <laughs> yeah. fat bones. Okay. And, you know, the, the, they're just harder and gnarlier. And, you know, you can hear when your knife hits. Like, you can hear the, the yeah. hardness of the bone is different. So everything about these things, they're just. They're just gnarly. Uh, less meat, less fat. Um, 
they're they're just not as doughy, you mm-hmm. know, as, as a as another hog. So they're they're lean, mean, acorn eat machines. What's neat is they are not a. It seems to me that we call them wild boar, which is the name of right. the wild species from sure. you know Eurasia, mm-hmm. the Eurasian wild boar, which is still the same species, Suscrafa. Right. But these pigs are wild boar genetics because wild boar were released here, mm-hmm. but also bred into escaped hogs yeah. and feral. Mm-hmm. And so you have this sort of mix of wild yeah, mix. and domestic mm-hmm. genetics in this animal. Mm-hmm. But even if it was a, you were talking about this recently, even if it was a purely domestic hog, mm-hmm. as soon as it kind of gets out in nature, mm-hmm. it starts growing tusks and reverting yep. back to yep. getting hairy and the whole thing, right? And, yep. They are just like made to return to the wild. Yeah, and I think they're one of the only ones that actually can do that within so one generation. Interesting. Yeah, it's so cool. Because I was I was reading recently that um, hogs were domesticated uh, independently in three different parts of the world oh, okay. over time. Like mm-hmm. you know, lots of people figured out the hog, sure. and then you get sort of like Pacific Islanders traveling by boat with hogs right. and put you know. The Spanish set, getting them thing. onto different islands. Yep, yeah, exactly. Dropping yep. them off on islands. Asaba They'll Island. They'll fend here. for themselves. Yep. Yeah, you got the famous mm-hmm. Asaba Island mm-hmm. hogs here. Yep. So, uh, what about? You know what do people? What do you? What are you looking for in a wild hog if you're gonna? Really oh man, utilize acorn food? fed ideally. Yeah. You know, okay. uh, you want to shoot them right at the. At, you know, two times a year that I really like are, they do the peach pigs, right? Oh, that must yeah, be which is cool. That they're must on the peach awesome. or- orchards and they're all following. That's kind of like a curaboda wild hog kind of deal. What's curaboda wild hog? You know, like the uh, curaboda is, is like a uh, uh, an alcohol fed kind of you know beer uh, fed or neat. you know okay. that kind of deal. It's like the wagyu of pork. Right? Okay. Um, so this is the, that version of that drunken pork. Right? Yeah. So oh, this oh, that's is, what that means. It's basically. Drunken oh, pork. yeah. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and make sure that. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, and I think that this they're getting their alcohol from rotted fruit. Obviously, yeah. it's not the same sort right. of deal. So it's a they're feeding a mash otherwise normally. I don't know how they exactly do it. It could okay. be you know. Like, I met a bison farmer once. And he would get all the beer. Uh, he would get the the mash from uh-huh. beer after uh-huh. they pour it off after they right. um, and then. It would have enough ferment. It have enough alcohol in it, right. but also enough grain to feed. And he was like, "It's nice because I got a small a space." And these bison are mm-hmm. a little bit drunk; they're more docile, and I'm not dealing oh. with the like rageful bulls. Oh, you know, that's that, nice. yeah. So it's oh. interesting, but uh, but anyway, mm. so peach. So uh, peach, peach, yeah. Uh, and then in the fall, you know, that's in like June, July, right? Was for the peaches, yeah. and then um, uh, probably October, November, December, right in there, depending on where you are in Georgia, you're going to have a big acorn crop, and the acorn fed wild boar is. Absolutely hard to beat. Cool. They'll actually put on a lot of, of good fat. They then. get quality fat. Yeah, and not as much as a as a conventional hog, but like well, you'll how see could some. They? There's how so could much they, fat right? On, right? But they'll put some fat on. Yeah, you know they'll they'll put some fat okay. on when they're eating a lot of those acorns. So there's a, a good two three week period in there where they are just prime, uh, and those are my favorite. I feel, it yeah. seems like if you live in a place where there's hogs, it's such a cool opportunity because it's year round yep. and it's 24 hours a day, right? Yep. So open season. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I feel like excited to uh, to do it again. Is good, where, you know, good, where I'm at good. with that. Hey, I want to. Sh- it's kind of a big gear shift here, but yeah. I want to talk about knife skills because okay. I have met a lot of chefs now mm-hmm. doing the doing what I'm doing, and surprising number of them with knives that they don't really maintain very well. Like yeah. a surprising a number of them who can't sharpen a knife. Yeah, I see them doing stuff with the knife on a stone. but right. I'll check the knife after and be like, mm, that's wah, barely wah. passable. Yeah. Um, but not only do you know how to maintain your knives, but you actually design your knives and have them kind of built for you right yeah generally speaking yeah uh like well the knives that i'm watching you work with yeah, are like that I've got your, here right your now, designs yeah. and you're working with a custom mm-hmm. knife manufacturer colson customs yeah give them a little shout, shout out we'll yeah. put we'll put it in the show notes too and then um seeing you know for instance the that drop that you have at the blade tip yeah, there yeah. um like specific things that you or that slicer you showed me the other mm-hmm. day with the reverse blade on it mm-hmm. um yeah the skinner the Skinner. The Skinner. Yeah, oh, yeah, thank you. Knife, yeah. Uh, yeah, just it's yeah. it seems like you really understand the physics of the knife work, and I have more than most, more than just about anybody I've talked to. Oh, cool. Uh, it was really cool to listen to you talk about it. It was right. like, oh, you've really gone down this rabbit hole, and you understand. Yeah. And also yeah. from an efficiency perspective, like you yeah. understand how the knife work can slow you down or allow you to produce more. Oh, yeah. So time. if I was just like, talk about knife skills, like what, what's right. your sort of general... Yeah, so I think understanding like which parts of the knives, or why that knife is designed the way it is. Nobody, yeah. nobody even does any of that. A lot of people buy knows. knives because they look cool oh, yeah, to like, them. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's that's cool. cool, right? Yeah. Or, and they don't know how to use them. The know? number of guys you see when they first start, well, not just guys, but the number of people you see when they first start hunting, the knives that they bring out in the field are They're just ridiculous. hilarious, yeah. man. The Rambo knives oh, or yeah. whatever, yeah. It's just hilarious. The Bowie knives me. and all that stuff. Yeah, because yeah. most of what I do in the field. 
I mean, that, that um, hand-forged knife that I showed you is mm -hmm. kind of the biggest knife I bring mm -hmm. out in the woods. Yep. Normally, I'll take pretty small knives. I yeah. can clean a deer with a really small knife. Like, I don't need a lot of knife. You don't need bushcraft uh, knives, right? Like, right. Uh, I need, yeah. Speaking, I need, you need uh, but anyway, knives. I know, and I feel like everybody's a little bit different. Like, everybody's yeah. got their own particular thing. Mm -hmm. But I just see knives a lot of time that are not really good for what they're intended for. And what drives me crazy is the, like, six functions, fire starter, oh God, bottle opener, saw blade on the back. I know. Like, I know. you know, or like in movies, one thing that drives me crazy, every medieval movie, guy always takes his sword and, like, sticks the tip in the ground and leans and on leans it like on it's a it. shovel or something. It's like, dude, the uh, last thing you're doing yeah. is taking the the tip of your sword of your blade machine. and yeah. driving it into the ground. That's yeah. every movie. You know what I'm talking oh, about? You exactly see it all the about, time. Yeah. Or banging sword blades yeah. together. Like, yeah. God, stop it. And then, like, that's how you would sword fight, just by hitting them together. And yeah, <laughs> exactly. Not I'm not trying works. to kill you. Yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying bang to your sword mess blade. Mess your sword up. <laughs> yeah. But anyway. i make you take it back. That thing you were talking about, about the different parts of the blade, yeah. seems like um, blades are shaped the way they are for a reason. Sure. And so, like, a, a Santoku, right? Like, that's a traditional all-purpose Japanese house chef knife, right? That has that means three cutting edges, right? That's what Santoku means. Okay. You like the heel of the blade, right? Like the fur, you know, if you're holding it, the 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 part closest to your your thumb, right? That's mm -hmm. the like the heel of the blade. That first third of that, that's your chopper, right? That's going to be the widest portion. That's going to give you clearance for your knuckles, and that's going to allow you to go whack 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 whack, chop 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 chop, and that'll allow for a straight up and down deal. Okay, that'll that allows you to go straight up and down and just chop chop chop. That's a speed unit. Cutting yeah. a carrot or something. Sure, or a garlic, shaving garlic. Yeah. Whack, 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 oh, okay. whack, whack, yeah, yeah, whack, yeah. You've heard me make that noise, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. This, we thought you were knocking on the door for us last night, and I was like, no, I think he's actually cutting vegetables. There you go, right? So that's that's like power slicing, you know, you yeah. know, wham, 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 and you'll slam through it, and then you'll see me do it on camera, and it's not something I would recommend doing until you're more comfortable you're with very cool. Oh, that's why you're a stunt chef. Right, right. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, uh, and there's a trick to it. It's all a parlor trick, right? Like, I'm just using the uh, center of my middle finger, that knuckle. As a guide. As a guide. And the blade is always in contact Doing with the that. Claw. And yeah. so I can do whatever I want without not even looking at it, off. not cut yourself. So mm -hmm. it's it's just a matter of confidence and, and that blade dynamics, right? <clears throat> so that's your chopper. In the center, that's kind of your rocker. And or your slicer, depending on the style of the blade, right, and how long it is. Um, but that allows you to do the, you know, the, the rock, right? Yep. And then the tip is like the, for detail work. So, you know, pull strokes, right? That's what we call those pull cuts, you know, when you're just pulling. Uh, and so that's kind of, you know, those are three basic, you know, all-purpose style knife usages, right? And uh, that's the Santoku. Now, if you've got like a slicing knife, right? Um, like a, you know, like a sushi, sushi blade, right? You know, you're going to see those guys start with a heel up high and then they're going to pull towards them all, mm -hmm. in, all in one single cut. Every time you go back and forth with a knife, uh, what are you doing, right? Uh, you're changing how that, that meat orients to the blade and then you're cutting it. So you're creating this like weird... I was trying to show this to people like, look, if I take your knife, even right. if it's really sharp, and I just press it down yeah. into my palm, it doesn't cut me till I slide the knife. So funny. So if that's how you cut, then maybe with your food, you want to slice it's, it. Man, in the... It's so funny you say that because like, that's part of the, one of the reasons I, I shock people in the kitchen. I'll be like, watch this. I'll take my nine inch chef blade and I'll push it into my arm <gasps> and they freak out. And I'm like, what are you freaking out about? I'll take it out. Nothing happened. Unless like, it's butter. Like, it's not... What happens if I move that blade one fraction of an inch forward Ugh, or backwards? It's horrible. The whole edge cuts. Exactly. You know? so, so when you cut something, do you just go wham and push down through it or do you slice through it like it's yeah. a lightsaber? Some people push straight down uh, and, and then like you it. said, many people saw. And they break it. Yeah. Many people saw. And I watching someone saw with a very, because my knives are sharp. Right. So if somebody saws with it, it's like, no. Oh my God. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that it's funny you, you said, because that's literally what I do to explain that particular particular aspect of a knife like yeah. the knife doesn't cut down it cuts forward and backwards yeah. um and nobody really nobody gets that when they first pick it up so yeah maybe i'll maybe i'll do a little uh a course just basic knife skills i think stuff. a knife skills thing would be cool from you because you have yeah. really good ones and like i said i'm good enough that they've brought you into to stunt double or, right, right. A, a, you know for a chef for or whatever a, i think sure. that's cool but but actually uh we have footage of you from our last visit you know in Every time we've watched through the episode, it's like, man, his knife skills are really good. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate so, it. Yeah, and I just think it's interesting how you you have some designs. Because mm -hmm. I talked to you. I love custom knives, but right. I have a lot of production knives, too. And right. I was like, man, I wouldn't mind having a custom chef's yeah, knife, fun. but I haven't wanted to get one because I don't know how right. to even describe what, what I want. want. And you yeah. were talking about 
so obviously this three parts of a knife blade for chef's knife is for a santoku for, for, for a, well okay that but seems it, it like pretty apply. basic yeah. knowledge but yeah. i didn't know that sure no one had ever broken that down uh, now for that you me. know it it's like oh and i will have a very different like i'll see mm-hmm. my chef's knives in a sort of different light so yeah anyway i found that really useful um oh, good any other thoughts about knives yeah um i love fujiwara's teriyasu fujiwara that's you know if, if money's no object i yeah. love those what do they cost between two hundred and twenty four hundred, depending yeah. on you know what you want. And, and you lean level. towards like a Japanese style knife. Yeah, generally speaking, I like their steel. German steel is really hard and it's durable and all that stuff, but it's it's harder for me to sharpen. You know, mm-hmm. I, I like to keep my knives pretty sharp. And there's other guys who don't like to sharpen all that often. They want a really hard edge, something that's been tempered. You know, mm-hmm. to 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 be super hard. Uh, I'm sort of. Mm-hmm. I'll back They're off also that a little all bit. thicker spine usually too, right? Like well, uh, a, a lot of, a lot of Japanese knives are thinner. Right? Yeah, and it, it kind of depends, right? Like, yes, they're usually a little thinner. And like shuns angles, are like razor blades, you know, yeah. and they're at that like 16 degree angle. It's sure. really tight. Exactly, you know? exactly. Um, um, and yeah, and, and I kind of put my own grind on them, I think, over time. That's what um, I do too. But... You know, and I try and do the two penny, you know, the overlapping penny. That's the angle, whatever, you know. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's kind of how I learned it was just take two pennies and overlap them, right? You know, one half over the other, and that creates an angle. That's the angle. If the the the, se- the second penny's halfway on yeah, it, correct, leaning, correct. and that's the angle and you that sharpen it. that sets up that. the angle. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because my, you were asking me, do I use flat stones? And I and I use this really cheaty system with... Um, from Spider Co. Draw thing? No, I wouldn't know. Oh, no. it's got the... Spider Co. has two stones that sit in uh-huh. angled pockets. Oh, that's cool. And so you just hold the knife straight up and uh-huh. down and draw this draw way. Through. And that way you never you never have to think about the angle. Oh, okay. But what you do have to do is get all your knives on that same... Grind. Yeah, you just uh, commit to like, okay, these different... are my angles. There's two... Bevel, okay. two bevels on there. But okay. anyway, I, sh- I sharpen like that because it's okay. really consistent. Yeah. Uh, because what I find is that most people can't sharpen knives because they don't have the discipline to be consistent about the angle. That's true. And you can also feel the angle. No one mm-hmm. ever tells you that. Like yeah. if you've just... It's like fishing, right? It's like big part of fishing seems it's to be... Because when I first started to fish, people would be describing things that they were feeling mm-hmm. through their rod and line like, that I'd what? be like, what? And they'd be like, oh yeah, the bottom here is doing yeah. this. And I'd be like, oh, I'm supposed to be noticing that? Right. But after a while, especially with braid, right. you're just like, man, you can... F- now I get you it. You really yeah. feel the vibration mm-hmm. of everything, even the material you that your weights are hitting. You your bait, you know, so, oh, yeah, no, bait, a bit, right, yeah exactly. Yeah. So um, similarly, you're f- sort of feeling out what that bevel is and setting yeah. it on the stone Absolutely. at that angle. Yeah. Yeah. And then knowing what I'm rocking over or under and folding an yeah. edge or whatever. Where'd yeah. all that come from? Did you like read about this? A little, you... little, little bit of that. And, um, you know, you pick up a few things from a few people and, you know, yeah, Corin and, you know, just I've always liked knives. Yeah. So, yeah, um, I guess that's just, yeah, I've been slow. Slow research over time. You were you cooked a few times over coals and fire uh-huh. this, this week, uh-huh. and um, it's and hard. you and I had a conversation. It's hard. You it's said? hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you and I had a conversation where I was about you were talking about knives, and I was saying how you know because I just got done reading a really great book called The First Peoples in a New World, and it was about um, you know fourteen thousand or so years ago when the first humans came over from Beringia and mm-hmm. came into the New World, and I mean this open continent full right. of megafauna and right. the whole story and we can kind of trace them mostly because of the um clovis point or whatever. yeah the yeah. clovis and Folsom points yeah. so these are the stone arrow points or spear mm-hmm. points or cutting tools that they were making from different materials and um just pointing out like this is one of the most ancient human technologies is knife blades yeah Right, we're like what we've been doing for the last three hundred thousand years, like knife blades, projectiles, and fire. Right, and you were sort of saying that, and that's kind of still what we were doing all week. Yeah, and I thought that was interesting because you were like, "Well, yeah, this is just like kind of fundamental to being a person." Yeah, is like fire and knives. You know, like those are things that you kind of want to get a handle on because they're they're super fundamental. Yeah, and I've you know when I was a kid, I. I I don't know why I thought this, but I thought it was it was like as a rite of passage, you know to be able to take care of myself in the outdoors. And I don't know why I thought I was going to be like stranded on an Island or something. I guess that was a, you know, childhood fantasy where you're, you know, yeah, you're it's, kind, it's a thing, thing that a lot right? of people think about right. though. You know, and, and maybe, maybe I read that book, uh, the wrong side of the mountain or the other side of the yeah, mountain. My or, side of the mountain. Of the mountain. Yeah. Call of the wild, those kind of things. Those always spoke to me and hatchet. Remember the movie? Hat- my, my wife's working on some, <laughs> that with some kids that she's yeah. tutoring it. So there was that, that side of it. And so I would try and, you know, give myself challenges and try and figure out how to make these fires and, so that became a good skill to have later on. You know, yeah. I, I think I actually understand, you know, the, the dynamics of how to build a fire, and, and that has really helped with food. 
Um, now that being said, it's still very difficult, you know, and you've got to factor in wind and all this kind of stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I have a lot of respect for guys like Francis Mallman who have, I don't know, like taking it to an art. Specialized in Specialized that. in. Yeah. I think a lot about the difference between the generalist and the specialist, mm. you know, and he's like a specialist of that right. particular methodology, right. right? I always, res- as a generalist, I love learning from specialists because I you can become way. better, right? I feel exactly the same way. Yeah. yeah. But, and it's, you know, you see that, oh, that's how they do, you know, yeah. you, you, it's, yeah. the, it's the other side of the, of the street kind of thing, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so yeah, and I and I think that is that is really true. Like I felt like I had to gain control over fire and just in general. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm gonna know how to make this any any you know out of any way, right? And then that's always been something that I've applied to cooking as well. Um, you know, I cook a lot over gas. Don't get me wrong, but any time that live fire presents itself in, in such a way that is not only efficient but better, mm-hmm. you know, because it has to be a little bit of both, right? It's got to be efficient enough for me to bother doing it. Yeah, I level, agree. Right? I like that about you, by the way. I like that you're not. Um such a fundamentalist that you got to do, you know, you, you seem to, to be like able I'm to pick the right practical. I'd like to think. Yeah, yeah. Well, but also like sometimes to me, it's like you get this big toolkit and it's right. like, let's take out the tool that's right for this job mm-hmm. and not try to force, yeah. you know, like yeah. the wrong thing just because I'm obsessed with only doing it this way right. or whatever. Right. You know? uh, well, and you know, pragmatic to a fault. I think yeah. is yeah. a lot of times, sure. well, you know, I, I feel that way about myself where it's like, I don't care. Get give me a sharpen rock. I'm gonna get this done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think there's a bit of that. And I, you know, a lot of times my cooks get really pissed off at me because I'll be like, go get me this. And by the time they get me, get back, I've, you've like, already done out. it. Yeah. <laughs> so I get that a lot. Um, so yeah. And, and I think that, you know, guys like that, I, I'm, I'm very enamored with because it's something that I know I'm, I'm mm-hmm. not right. Like these, right. these incredible no. specialists like mm-hmm. the Cristiano Criminelli, right. He, he, again, this, this level of commitment to one thing, kind of like blows my mind yeah you know it's like how do you how do you do how do you uh, how do you stay in a lane yeah, that long exactly. i like to change lanes a lot so and, much yeah so but i appreciate it yeah i appreciate it. i'm that so glad they're doing it they're, right yeah thank keeping, god they're there keeping things alive and passing it on to another mm-hmm. generation and then inspiring because i always feel like okay if they're at 10 i just if i can be at two or three mm-hmm. that's good enough for the few times i'll break that out right. or use it or whatever so right. Yeah, I just thought it was a cool observation uh on your part um hey man what makes a good fisherman Oh man, a lifelong commitment. Mm-hmm. Just like a commitment to this. Sport. I by the way I want to just clarify. Yeah. I say fisherman. Yeah. And I I say it like when we say mankind. Right. I, I feel like some people are going to using the word angler, but I don't like it because it doesn't encompass net fishing or spear sure. fishing. Sure. So it's specific, I, yeah. I you know, people who fish, I'd say fisher, but that's a type of animal. So right. yeah. anyway, but yeah. Fisherman. I I'll think say, I'm gonna say fisherman. Whatever. The women I know who fish and I really respect. They uh, they all say fishermen. They call themselves fishermen. Cool, right on. Like the people who lobster up in Maine, all the women who do that, they're fishermen. Yeah, Yeah, there you go. All right, so anyway, what what makes makes a good fisherman? fisherman? All right. Um, Well, I think, you know, being able to read the water is always a big part of it, whether you're a trout fisherman, you know, sword fisherman, right? Anything in between. Understanding your environment is a big part of it. There's rod work, which I equate sort of to like knife work, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, actual, you know, just the physical part of that being out there with you guys i was feeling particularly around you i was feeling like uh oh man i got a lot long, long way to come in understanding how to really utilize oh, this tool I, did, I don't know about that i thought you did pretty damn good well, i um, feel like when it came down to like i was really dealing fish, with that fish job. did a great job because i was super conscientious because right. i didn't want to lose it right but overall there was a lot of like at one point you were, like, you were like telling me like dude quit reeling while there's line oh, going right, out you're, right, twisting, right. Your you're braid, twisting your braid you're yeah. weakening yeah. your line yeah. and it's like oh i didn't even realize i was doing with that. the conventional you can do it you mm-hmm. can just keep cranking because it's not gonna it's not spinning in a circle right. but yeah when you're when you're reeling against the drag that's mm-hmm. that's no good yeah. yeah yeah so stuff like that and um you know just kind of understanding some dynamics um untangling knots <sighs> maybe that's the biggest one that's a hard one i got a buddy who uh was a captain in north carolina and he uh he said when they get a new guy in the boat, hmm. they would uh, they would blow up a, a conventional reel. And just hand right? it to him. And just hand <laughs> it to him. Yeah, get a big bird's nest going and say, like, fix this. Actually, that's a great idea. Yeah. I'm going to do that to people. He said when they like. needed them f- to learn to flay fish, they'd just put a box of fish and be like, all right, flay all these, you know, and they just keep doing that until the person could. Oh, man, that's cruel. Yeah. But anyway, you know, it's exper- the point being experience. it's experience, right? Yeah. yeah, they did that to me in Italy. They gave me a box of squid and a box of rabbit every day, and that yeah. was all I did. Eventually, you Super. were real good at that. Oh, man. <laughs> Still Tear probably are, right? Yeah. Tear it up. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, uh, understanding tension, right? Like there's a couple of like weird, I don't know, s- sort of ethereal, like strange, um, 
concepts when it comes to like casting and rod work and, and all this kind of stuff, right? Understanding tension and understanding yeah. how to load a rod. You know what that yeah, means, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Loading a rod. When you're going to cast. Explaining that to somebody, right, when you're going to cast. Explaining that to somebody who doesn't know what that is, it's like explaining umami. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know, man. I give up. I don't know how to explain this to you, but watch. And so whether it was like baseball growing up or you know any of the sports or anything like that, I was always trying to mimic people I knew were really good. Yeah. And I would mimic that in my head and think about, what are they doing? And I would put all that together, and then through that, I was able to develop that technique. Yes. Uh, modeling. Yeah. Yeah. So for people listening who are like, what's load a rod? You're talking about basically get when you're going to cast the rod, yep. letting the weight of whatever you're... Yeah, yeah. But the weight of whatever is the terminal tackle, mm -hmm. you let that parabolically bend the mm -hmm. rod back. Yep. And then you're basically almost like a catapult. Like an atlatl when or you something. Yeah, when you yeah. release that, yeah. you sling that weight forward, and it's all, the, the it's rod is bent like a back. kendo strike. Yeah, and then uh -huh. it bends forward yeah. and sets. So mm -hmm. you're letting the rod work for you yeah. rather than you trying to throw it like a baseball. Correct. It's not just moving a single unbending right. rod. <laughs> right, right, right. It's right. not that at all. It's, you know, you're yeah. creating flex in this I feel thing like that... watching surf casters is how you figure there that you out. There you go. Go watch a surf caster. Because, I mean, they got a lot of weight on there, and yep. they got this long rod, and mm -hmm. they got to really get it cranked back. Yeah, that sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah. it sounds miserable um, uh, but yeah so that's that's a big one you know there's like there's some physics I think yeah. that are involved in it and then finding fish man that's kind of its own thing and, and, and fishing is vast yeah. like cooking is vast the knowledge that goes into something like that that has application all over the world in all these different environments I don't know that you can ever know all the stuff you know? yeah. it's, it's so so very vast and you move from one area to another it's like a martial art it's like maybe you're going to learn you know like I said like kendo one day and and I don't know, jujitsu the next, right? It's, it's, they're all similar, but they're all completely different. I feel like if you stayed in one place for a while and you got yeah. good at one fishery, mm -hmm. then if you go to a new fishery, it can be completely different. Totally. But it, a lot will translate in how to learn it. Sure. But if you Absolutely. never learn any one fishery yeah. very well, you're mm -hmm. going to be disadvantaged jumping yeah. around a lot yeah. um, because it'll take longer to develop the core skills yep. that you'll need, mm -hmm. right? I think that's very true. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, for me, a lot of the stuff that I grew up doing was fishing in little creeks. Um, you know, when I was really little, I was, you know, like, a, like very, very small. I was fishing for bluegill, right? And that was kind of that, like, that was that fish that really opened you up. And I was like, oh, I can catch these by myself. And that, yeah. that started the whole thing. And that went to bass, right? And then, you know, bass became bass and trout. And then trout became striper or, you know, whatever. And you kind of evolve your way through all these fisheries. And you pick up some, some stuff from each one. And sometimes you realize that, like, something you thought worked really well or did work really well in one fishery kills you in the next mm -hmm. so you have to unlearn that behavior you know like circle hooks are a good example right um you know people they always want to set the circle set the hook, hook yeah. and it's really tough and, and in a way you, you kind of still do you've got to get all the tension out of that all the stretch out of that line before before you, go before you do it. any of that mm -hmm. you know you still need a you know you, i do it like a slow lift once i've cranked all that line out yeah because sometimes i feel like that the, the lift. point of the hook is touching the right. meat enough to drag the fish around right. but not until you give it a little through. bit it doesn't really necessarily c cut in i think so too but yeah. it's not a yank it's right. a slow hard yeah because otherwise you're just yanking it out of his mouth just yeah i did that out. several times well the next time i want to get you on some cast net stuff you know i'd like to get you down here in the summertime when it's really our our season this is kind of our off season yeah right. you know this is when we we try and figure yeah, out yeah i'd love to, to learn do. to throw a cast net by the way well and you know going after pogies here in this environment we do mm -hmm. use a cast net i'm not sure but i think up north they're using a lot more snatch hooks we almost stuff. never use a cast net up north but in okay. florida i see it a lot, a lot where we're, lot we're fishing for bait but yeah. i you know i never cast it I, sure. my buddy always does you have so many rocks i assume it would just shred your nets yeah we don't we don't use nets like that don't even no. bother huh mm -hmm. sabiki rigs right yeah a lot of sabikis, sabikis all the time yeah. okay. so you can still sabiki them it's still doable but you know it's a I think the majority of the world feeds themselves with cast nets. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about third world kind of fishermen. When you see people throw a cast net, and just for people listening, can yeah. you describe it? It's like big round net. So it's a circular net, right, that will actually be, there'll be a hole in the middle that has lines that run every, that, that run through the, the, the hole that's in the center that attach to lead weights at the bottom of the net. So when you throw it. Wait, if, if, if somebody's looking at it, it's, it's a, a circle, circle and the, the weights are all along the, the perimeter, perimeter of the circle. Correct. There's a hole in the center. In which all of these thin, they call them, uh, what they call them braille lines, I think. These lines run all the way through and connect to the bottom, to the, to the, uh, to the, what would you even call those that? weights? Right? To those weights, or or near those weights, in between those weights. And so when you throw that, it's got a couple little hang points that provide a little tension when you throw. Do you put it. any of it in your mouth? I do. Yeah. I, I've got a whole system. Because yeah, I, I see can... different way, a couple different ways people yep. handle it. I, you know, I I fold it, I roll the net a couple of times, I split the net throw some over my shoulder, yeah. fold that over my hand, reach down halfway, put that in my mouth, fold it back over, 
toss. Okay, and the goal is that in the air, it unfurls into Correct. a perfect circle Correct. that lands on the water, and Sinks then the down. weights come down and swing underneath. Correct. Correct. And then when you pull it, it it's cinches closed. Close up. Mm-hmm. Um, when I watch somebody do that, it's like watching archery or something. Yeah, like, totally. this is ancient. You can just ancient. see there's something about it. Goes, mm-hmm. it's like genetic memory or it's ergonomics or something where you're like, man, this is like a, this is not like driving a car. It's like no, it's a new thing. This is like you know, a, it's, it's, a very old yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, and it's something that's still. I mean, they're getting, they're inventing this, reinventing this technology every year. And there's like a better mm-hmm. net. But it's something that's like you said, like, you know, this is these things are handmade by people in mm-hmm. you know, places where they don't have monofilament. And they're using kite string or whatever right. you know like yeah. this this is a yeah. this is a this is used everywhere yeah you know? i want to go back one one other thing you were yeah. saying about fishing was uh mm-hmm. tension on the line and yeah and i feel like when you're fishing with somebody new that's the hardest thing to watch yep. of everything is where they have a fish on and they let slack in the, the line yeah 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 and you're just like everybody <gasps> on the boat's like no no can't get the tension on the line yeah yeah um and basically if you let that that tension between you it reminds me this is a weird analogy but it reminds me of when you're first dating somebody you like maintain that Uh, tension between you if you let the connection go slack right you're Uh, liable to lose that person right you need to keep each other on the line it's like you you can't let too much space happen you got to keep things fun yeah you got to kind of keep that tension um and i think every relationship's like that it's like a Mm -hmm. it's a there's you want a little tension. If things, if you don't have tension, it's like things go away from each other. Yeah. So yeah. fishing is like that. It seems like it's, you give any, any space to that fish. Or, or even forget about the fish. How about just the lure, right? Like anytime yeah. the tension disengages with that lure, what do you Dead have? Action. A tangle. Oh, okay. Got you. you know okay, what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, uh, that's when we were talking about flinging the weights towards me, right? Like on the, on the boat, I had a, I have a system that allows me to remain safe and you to get me what I need so I can put on what you need and get you back fishing quickly. Mm-hmm. All that's based on tension, right? And like there's no slack, there's no bouncing, yeah. there's no anything. Okay. So tension okay. is safe. Right. And your line is nice and straight, you're exactly. saying, so you're not getting exactly. tangles basically. Exactly. Yeah. So we had somebody pretty new to fishing on the boat and yeah. it was like... Blue you know, water mark? Yeah, blue water mark. Sure. Yeah, big game hunter mark too. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, watching... Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> watching, you know, those couple times where they'd be like, yeah. you'd be like, no, 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 just yeah. I just feel everybody on the boat like going like, ah! Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, anyway, you figure it out pretty fast after yeah. you lose them. Because, yeah, the thing is, this fish pop off hooks really oh, easy. Oh, so easy. Huh? Just so... It's amazing to think as that... As soon as they have, don't have that tension, of, yeah. Out of a piece of flesh that quickly. Yeah, and it doesn't come out of your hand that easily. It really doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. Um, what makes a good chef? Oh, man. I don't know. Or even a good cook, I man. think I'm still trying to figure that out. A good cook, I can answer that one. All right, okay. a good cook, um, one they execute under the brand of the chef, right? They're not trying to do their own thing. They're just trying to make that guy look really good. They're trying to do his food really well. Speed, organization, um, a- ability to manipulate their food and get what they Say want. Say more about the organization. So everything, mise en place, right? Yep. Everything in its place. Yep. Without that, there is no commercial food. Yep. I mean, if there is, it takes forever to get. How about that? So organization allows you to do anything. Even in your house. I mean, Even in your it's house, It's just like right? if you don't it's set it up life, right. You yeah. know, in your life. And I take that if I'm cleaning guns, if I'm, mm-hmm. if I'm sharpening knives, mm-hmm. if I'm organizing my closet, Chopping onions, whatever Everything it is. has to be sort of, mm-hmm. it's like before you do a job, get all the shit you need for the job. Sure. Prepare the space to do the job. Because yeah. if you Think don't, it man, it's the worst is when you're halfway through a project and you have stuff all in your own way. Yeah. Oh, you know, man. and you're yeah. like doing like a dance over some boxes yeah. and around and you're like, yeah. what this, if I just stopped and cleared the space, yes. I'd be more efficient. And that's yes. kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, like, I think I, I use all of that up in my food life and, and, and need a little more of that in my own personal, <laughs> Your personal life. life. Right? Yeah. Well, um, but yeah, that's, that's like, that's, that's like mechanics. Part. It's like, exactly. they got a bunch of cars that need work yep. in their yard yeah, or whatever. The carpenter with a carpenter. Yeah, house. Car- yeah. I got a buddy who's yeah. building a house all the time. He has got two paint swatches on his walls that have been there for <laughs> three four years maybe five years probably wow i'm like are you ever gonna paint these walls he's and like oh, when i'm done anymore. when i'm done working on other people's houses i'll do it yeah exactly <laughs> that's funny um so yeah speed you know and then speed 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 is everything yeah. um you know I, I that's it's a lot of my job you know when i when i think about like just moving especially when it's a line cook like just moving around and making things you know, you do one thing one day, you literally time yourself and be like, I'm going to beat that by 10 seconds. Um, that used to be a thing we would do. I remember we'd make Rockefeller base and it's such a long drawn. This was at five and 10, such a long drawn out thing that, you know, 
I would compete with whoever the fastest guy was. And I'd like just, <laughs> you know, and, and again, this guy like could care less probably, but yeah. you know, he just happened to be, fa- and I was trying to catch him, yeah. you know, and eventually right. figure out how to catch him, yeah. you know, but it's trial and error and you're really, but finding your shortcuts and active, finding where you can shave it's off actively trying. I think mm-hmm. that's a big part of it, right? So many people don't actively try. You know, you're a human being. You can do incredible things if you actually try, yeah. but you got to try. You know, it's sometimes it's like applying because it almost sounds like you're doing a bit of this. Like my shooting instructor, he approached it like a football coach. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things he would do when we would shoot is he would videotape us. And oh, then at yeah. the end of the day, we would watch ourselves in slow motion. Changes and you would be like, because, right? yeah, well, because the other thing is you'd be like, no, no, my trigger control is good. You know, right. and then it's like, well, let's watch it. And you're like, right. well, it looks kind of shitty. Yeah. Or like, oh, why are you flinching there? Right. What about, you know, and you can't deny it when you're watching yourself right. on slow motion in video. Yep. Right. Um, it's painful almost, but then yeah. you learn not to do it. Sure. Uh, and it's just applying those because we figured out how to take athletes out of high school and mm-hmm. turn them into high performance machines. Sure. So I've tried to then, I learned it from my shooting coach years ago, and now I try to apply it to everything that I do mm-hmm. to that kind of consistency. Mm-hmm. I would rather be, if I'd rather be consistent but wrong mm-hmm. because then when I correct, you're on it. It's like, oh, I just need to come one inch to the left, yeah. but I'm at least doing it the same way every it's time. It's like playing your slice in golf. You don't yeah. really want to yeah, do that. Yeah, you don't want to change yeah. stuff every yeah. time. And yeah. it seems like, for instance, with your knife strokes and stuff, right. when I watched you cut those fish. It's like it, just one knife stroke the same way every time. Mm-hmm. I can just tell that you're not varying it. You're like, no, face the fish Some, like this. I mean, it. I have certain, like, y- yes, that's true. Generally speaking, I have some points that are uh, that are must-haves. I do, at a certain level, at a certain point, you get to a certain level where you do test out different things. Yeah, oh yeah. And I try yeah, yeah. things. Oh, I get that. I'm not talking about right. testing out, but I mean, there, there are some. Sometimes it's like you watch somebody and they do, do something, something li- every time, and it's willy nilly, right. so they never know when it's good and sure. they never know when it's bad. And that you're never going to catch the fast guy if you're willy nilly. You have to. That's true. I mean, sometimes you test new things sure. to figure and, oh, it out. Oh, that is quicker. Or, yeah. Oh, that's right, way slower. Right. But yeah. you're not just like every time coming in with right. everything a little bit different. And right. just, you know, for me, it's like when I, when I, shoots like and then we have we have this gear load out on our right. belts it's like right. i need my magazines to be exactly the, the same, same place, place every time because when i reach down for them i want it to be muscle memory oh what, where's this yeah yeah, yeah. i don't shift it or mess sure. with it unless i'm testing something mm-hmm. so anyway i just noticed you have an, a very precise approach to your knife work and to your i could see how you would learn to catch somebody right with that right. Men- mental attitude that you have yeah yeah well and i think it's again like active you know it's like active sonar versus passive sonar mm-hmm. right like, one's more effective, right? You know, you <laughs> yeah. got to burn a little energy. Yeah. It's a calorie burn. Yeah, I yeah. get it. But you want to get better or you just want to take the paycheck and go home? Yeah. You know, what, right. what do you do? I mean, and when you're working at a, at a, at a restaurant and stuff and you're working there for a reason, it's not just for the money, right? It's, yeah. it's not great money. It's not, it's not a good enough reason. You need to be learning. Yeah. Um, especially in the cooking end of it. Cause you know, we're, cooks are paid hourly, right? Yeah. They're not making the big money that some of the servers are getting, you know, they're taking home 500 bucks a night. That's not happening. Mm-hmm. You know, they're getting right. $71, whatever that number is, you know, for, for their six or eight hour shift, you know? So you've got to be taking something else home and that needs to be knowledge. And if you're not taking that home, then you, you're leaving, you're leaving knowledge and potential money on the table. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What gets you excited about the interface of food, hunting and fishing, hmm. um, nature, you know, like what's the, how, how do those things pri- come together for that's you? That's a primordial itch that I'm constantly scratching, yeah. I think, you know, it's like, I just love the idea of collecting ingredients and like going out and like bringing food back. Mm-hmm. So that, that has to be, right? I mean, I don't know, I don't know what that is other than like some yeah. sort of a primal thing where it's like, I don't know, I just enjoy it, you know? Yeah. You said something that's become one of my favorite lines from all of the season one episodes that we made of okay. Wild Fed. You, you and I are having a conversation. We've just met, and we're talking about the flavors of a place, and you say uh-huh. it's like a geotag of flavor. Yeah, yeah. And that is just like the coolest <laughs> idea, you know? I like that idea myself as well. So, yeah. so there's, like, there's a piece about food being local to you that's important as well. Huh? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, and, and I said that in reference to everybody ordering from these big box companies, which, mm-hmm. like, don't get me wrong, I have accounts. Uh, yeah, of course. I, I mean, I you have them. to, right? You have yeah, to, I get right? It, yeah. I get it. But when we're all using the same stuff, nothing ha- is, is unique anymore. Yeah. So I, I like the idea of, you know, using the stuff that's around me because it's it becomes it becomes part of the, the terroir and the flavor and the, and just you know it's in the ether, right? It's it's in the spaces in between the spaces, um, and those those slight differences make food special. Yeah, and again, you know, obviously we're trying to get good genetics and all these specific things that go into these, 
you know, these, these new species of apples or, you know, man, or whatever that is, you know, you've got to hit all these parts, but, uh, and there's some that are going to be better than others like Vidalia, right? Greatest place to grow an onion ever. You know, yeah. that doesn't mean I don't like onions from Italy, right? right? right, right you know, right. they're just a little different. So I think those, those subtle di- differences are, should be, you know, celebrated yeah. a little bit. Now, it's not that easy. I understand, you know, it, it, these guys, they've got to make, they've got to make their food cost marks mm-hmm. you know? and you have to have the market to sell, to sell that, that kind of product. You yeah. know, if, if you don't have people that are willing to pay for it, then mm-hmm. you're not going to make any money and you can't do it at all. So yeah. I absolutely get it, you know. Well, I just feel I just I kind of want to wrap it up by saying yeah. that I feel like you got a, the right balance of all these things, man. You're thanks. You're kind of to being around you is a bit. You're a bit of a hurricane. Yeah, totally. But the tornado. there's an eye at the center of that hurricane yeah, that's really okay. So at the center of that, yeah. man, you're in a really cool. You just have the right balance of of all these things. So being around you is like a really. It's been a cool opportunity for me. I've learned a ton. Uh, awesome. I've got a lot of inspiration. Cool. And there's a lot I'm going home to work with. So uh, okay. it's just been great. Thank you for hosting My us. Pleasure. My pleasure. Man, and we got so so much out of this. Um, yeah, and I'm going to be taking on a lot of like uh, what I learned from you. So Well, uh, you know, my phone's always on. Give me a buzz if you ever need will, it. You know, I will, man. I will. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.